Hello and welcome everyone to this uh, uh, round table on citizen science policy and practices in India. I'm very, very happy and also thankful to have all of you here. And uh, we are happy to have like uh, stakeholders and representatives from different organizations and uh, and other uh, you know associations and uh, government bodies that either work in the area of citizen science or are in position to save the discourse of citizen science in the country. We are organizing this activity as a step towards uh, uh, developing an understanding of challenges of doing citizen science in the country. And what are the policy interventions that uh, you know we can have both at the national level and at the institutional level, which are required to facilitate more citizen science projects in the country? And how we can maybe go towards uh, building a network of citizen science projects that can act uh, at the domestic level as a, maybe a resource center or as a policy advocacy group, but also can engage with the international citizen science projects and associations. So it's really uh, like from our side, a first attempt or a first step in that direction. And we would we are really looking forward to have all of your insights and inputs so we can you know go towards in developing such, such framework and network. Uh, uh, I will just share a slide. I've done that. Yes, can you see the slide? Anyone can confirm? Yeah, it is visible, Suresh. Awesome. Uh, so uh, the idea is that uh, like this, uh, this work that we are uh, doing now is a continuation of uh, what uh, like one policy paper that we published in which uh, we tried to understand, uh, it, it was based on a preliminary, preliminary study where we tried to understand the challenges and opportunities of doing citizen science in the country and what kind of policy framework that is required to uh, you know, do such projects, and uh, um, then like some of these challenges that we realized from from our that preliminary studies are mentioned here. I think one of the biggest challenges that uh, is there uh, with respect to citizen science is the lack of awareness. And when I say lack of awareness, it's not only uh, among the general public; it's also among scientists. Like a lot of scientists don't know the potential and use of citizen science. Uh, uh, many of the policymakers don't know exactly how citizen science can fit into uh, the broader policy perspectives and how it can act as a as a catalyst of change on on, on many of the science related uh, projects. Also, there's a, a somehow lack of facilitative policy. I think that also comes from the lack of awareness. And even when the scientists themselves are not always aware, like uh, policies are something which are far behind and institutional mechanisms. So. Policy not only at the national or state level, but also at the institute level, uh, and the mechanisms to support citizen science are often missing. Uh, related to this is also, also lack of funding, uh, uh, both uh, I believe the government funding, but also funding uh, from the universities and uh, from the CSR uh, kind of private uh, funding is also uh, missing. Even crowdsourcing uh, is not there to that extent so much, especially in case, in case of India when it when it is about uh, citizen science. The data quality, reliability, and ownership issues uh, also are there. Uh, there is no clear policy on those, I believe. Uh, and those things still need to be discussed and you know, further developed. Uh, and I think this discussion uh, that we are having today would act as a, uh, like a step in that direction. And also the policy related to how to keep the volunteers, uh, how to recruit them, and how to keep them, and what kind of incentives should be there. Uh, uh, you know, those kind of uh, uh, things are also missing. Now. Uh, so these are some of the objectives I have already mentioned, and this was also shared in the in the concept note that we 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 forwarded to all of you. So uh, I would uh, just skip this slide in the interest of time. Uh, what we really want to have is uh, um, all these stakeholders through these meetings and maybe in the future meetings to come together and form uh, some kind of a, a loose network to start with uh, to work. Uh, uh, as I was saying, engage at the, the national level with the policymakers to let everyone know that this is why it is important and this is what we have to do, but also engage with the uh, other international uh, projects. A uh, that, lot of that is already being done, and I believe some of you will be talking about those, but uh, uh, we probably need a national level framework uh, to do that, uh, to take it to the next level. And as outcome of this event, I was just mentioning, we would uh, really like to take all of your recommendations and suggestions and remarks and prepare a report. And then we'll be sharing with all of you for your further comments, but we will also 
like to say that uh, uh, with the government uh, agencies and also other other science academies and so on, where uh, you know some of those things can be taken forward. Uh, that's one uh, outcome, and the second is uh, uh, like discussion to how to what should be the next steps of of, uh, of doing citizen science in the country and from the policy perspective, what can we do next? So those are some of the things that we want to discuss here. And uh, yes, I would stop my presentation. And just one second. Yeah, uh, just to before we start the discussion, I would request uh, for your cooperation on a, on a few things. So first, uh, uh, please try to keep your remarks and comments brief, uh, if possible. And please stick uh, to the main points that you want to convey. And another thing, like sometimes it might not be possible for you to make your remarks or comments in the in the time that is there. So you can also put them in the chat box, and there can be a parallel discussion going in the chat, which would be really nice. Uh, also, if it is not possible uh, uh, to like have all the points discussed today, we can also uh, start the conversation through the email. And the email line that is there, I think all of you are uh, in that email, so we can continue on some of those points, uh, like taking them forward from from that direction as, as well. Now, uh, I would request you to keep your audios out uh, off when you are not speaking. Uh, you can keep your videos on the whole time; that's totally fine. But uh, just to avoid this kind of echo, uh, please uh, uh, keep your audios off when you are not speaking. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, also we have some uh, some people who have joined as observers. Uh, who are not uh, making comments, but they are just uh, you know, observing the event and learning from it. So I would request them to keep your, their videos and audios, both of them off. Um, and yeah, that's all. To, uh, as there's a few points that I wanted to mention. Now uh, let's directly, without wasting any time, let's directly jump to our uh, uh, maybe the first section where we have uh, uh, our 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 friends and partners from from the international organizations here, Mendel and Libby. And uh, uh, we would uh, invite them maybe one by one to uh, talk about uh, uh, the Global Citizen Science Partnership, Australian Citizen Science Association, and the Citizen Science uh, um, uh, Libby and Mendel, like who would like to go first? And then um, I'll kick I'll kick off, and then uh, Libby will go into some detail. But we'll go back and forth a little bit so that it's a bit more engaging for everyone. Um, okay, so, so let me just give me one second to quickly introduce you. Uh, oh yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. And then uh, maybe you can both start. Uh, so uh, Mendel here is a, is a is a board member of the of the Global Citizen Science Association, and he is also the uh, co-founder of the Citizen Science Asia, which is a non-profit organization dedicated to building uh, capacity and conservation and conversations for citizen science activities in Asia. Uh, Libby is a, a, a vice chair of the Global Citizen Science Partnership, and also she is associated with the Australian Citizen Science Association, and uh, she has been working in this area for a long time and. Uh, we are really uh, looking forward to learn from both of them uh, about uh, their structures, activities, resources, and possible impact of uh, you know their respective associations and what is the current work they are doing, and hopefully also learn how some of the Indian citizen science projects can you know work with them. So over to you, uh, Mendel and Libby. Thank you very much again for being here. Thank, thanks for the kind intro, Shres, and uh, thanks for having us here. Um, I'm sure Libby will echo the same, but I think it's a great opportunity for just as much for us to learn about how you guys are doing in the development, but we're looking forward to share what we can uh, to help um, the development along, obviously. Uh, so let me just share my screen. So let's see if that's good. Can you guys see my screen okay? Great. All right, so I guess what we'll do is just a really quick, um, I'm gonna talk about citizen science in Asia specifically first. Uh, we'll hand over to Libby to give a bit of Australia context, then we'll come back and talk about the global partnership in terms of um, two different parts. Um, but just to, in the interest of time, let me kick off. Um, as Sarah already mentioned, so yeah, I'm the co-founder and co-chair for CitizenScience.Asia. Um, I also sit on the board for the uh, global partnership. Uh, and finally, there's a CS Track European uh, project that's looking at the um, sort of the progress, how to measure citizen science activities. So that's um, something I'm sitting on as an external board advisor as well. So really happy to be here to sort of give a bit of context from an Asia standpoint. Um, I'm sure people kind of know what citizen science is, but just as a very quick recap, there's a lot of different definitions. Um, the one I tend to use when we give these is really in the context from a global standpoint. Um, when we first started, which we'll come into for the global partnership, one of the things back um, at the UN um, Environment Assembly is we sort of have a template definition for citizen science just to give context to what we're about. 
So just to recap here is really professional science alone can't provide the information at the scales and resolutions necessary to understand environmental changes. So the dumbing culture of scientific expertise doesn't account for the different ways of knowing and often fails to engage the public. So obviously, as Suresh already alluded to, uh, really is about engaging more of the community and filling in some of the gaps and working with the professional scientists to sort of expand um, sort of our, our ability to gain knowledge. Um, obviously, for us in Asia, one of the things I like to highlight, because it is very important for us in Asia, um, as these things tend to be, is a little bit behind in terms of the maturity cycle, um, even though Technically, there's actually a long history of citizen science practice from bird watchers to cherry blossom um, observations, yearly observations. A lot of that has already been done for a long time. It might not have been called that. Um, so as a concept, as a modern concept, is relatively unknown for a lot of the populations. Again, something that's already alluded to. So that's something that uh, we're going to address in a little bit. Um, obviously, as we all know, there's a lot of countries that make up Asia and accounts for nearly 60% of the population. Uh, so it is really, really important for us to be represented in a lot of these global conversations. Um, and obviously, with all the upcoming challenges due to climate change, pollution, the loss of biodiversity, again, citizen science plays an important role in this aspect. And most importantly, from an Asia standpoint, there's a lot to contribute in that respect. Um, and obviously, that also accounts for the fact that uh, there's a huge amount of diversity. So beyond just India, obviously, you got China, you got Southeast Asia. There's a lot of different aspects and sort of indigenous knowledge that can be represented through sort of citizens um, exploration of knowledge. So just to sum that up, it's obviously needing to engage and develop and coordinate Asia alongside the other international counterparts in this citizen science movement. So citizen science Asia, what are we about? Um, we've been around four or five years now. Uh, we were founded on the basis. We really wanted to make sure that there's a representation for us as a region. So how this came about, it sort of ties in very closely with some of the partnership history as well. And I'll go into that a little bit, but just to focus on Asia, really, I was sitting at the table with a whole bunch of other people around the world. Um, and despite the fact that Asia has such a huge population diversity, we're talking about mosquito projects. And obviously it's a, it's, it's a worldwide problem that affects everyone. I was literally the only person from Asia sitting at that table and I'm not a scientist. So compared to a lot of you guys who probably should be sitting at the table, no one else was there. So for me, what I found um, a bit unfortunate was that there really isn't as much of the unity for Asia as, as it should be for this type of conversation. So I think it was really important to have sort of a representation. That's where I found it Asia. Instead of focusing on just in Hong Kong, which was where I'm based, or Southeast Asia, I want it to be something a little bit wider to sort of bring together the challenges and sort of the uh, find the synergy between this entire region, which obviously has its uniqueness compared to the, the rest of the world. Um, so for us at Citizen Science Asia, one of the visions is really we believe in everyone having the opportunity to contribute to knowledge discovery and affect positive changes in our world through citizen science. So we believe citizen science has a lot of power, has a lot of ability to, to affect some of these things. So the mission that we've put for ourselves is really to help build the grassroots connections, sustainable capacity, and the tangible conversations in Asia to support this vision. So I won't go into too much details given sort of the, the, the amount of time we have, but just really quickly, just to give a sense, Citizen Science Asia, what we're doing um, in sort of those three missions. Um, for the connections building is obviously about facilitating the dialogues across the practitioners and projects across Asia. First thing is really just making sure everyone's aware of other projects so we can leverage other people's avail abilities. Um, and also just to sort of market a little bit of what Asia is doing for the international um, audience as well. Um, so what we're doing is really trying to reach out to the general public um, and also sort of advocate and let people know what citizen science is and how people can contribute. Um, in this regard, we basically have a community pillar, which is really focused on reaching out to people in the community, individuals like yourselves who obviously are aware of citizen science, but also people from an education standpoint, maybe um, teaching kids and older people who can help participate. So this sort of leads into that other um, aspect in terms of capacity building. It really is encouraging the sharing of open data for public consumption and analysis. So instead of things being siloed in a scientific professional space, we really want to make sure that um, we're leveraging sort of the wide diversity, the wide um, population we have to build that capacity that can be um, uh, uh, sort of uh, imp improved upon. Um, so part of this is really, as I alluded to, just in terms of as an education pillar, is really reaching out to schools, try to um, bring this into um, governments and schools who are focusing really on STEM activities to give them an idea how citizen science can play into this. So it's sort of 
um, embellishes sort of the program so that people are looking at citizen science as a viable option uh, in terms of solution options. So finally, in terms of conversations, how is this different? Just general co uh, connections, as I already mentioned. This is really sort of working with um, more top down in terms of whether it's government, whether it's social enterprises, sort of the people trying to figure out solutions. So one of the things we try to encourage is really decouple the problem definition with the solution finding. A lot of times there's a bit of jumping straight to the solution without understanding the problem. And I think if people understand what citizen science is about, part of the big thing is around getting data, getting accuracy, getting understanding and context. And that's where citizen science as one part really helps in terms of the problem definition side. Let's put aside the solution. Let's really understand what the problem is about. Let's get the citizens involved, understanding the definition of the problem. They sort of have the buy-in, they understand and trust the data. So they find it much more relevant and would be much more willing to commit to what the solution is. So it's about building this conversation and joining up the problem with the solution. And therefore we can sort of come up with much more objective, uh, much more relevant um, solutions that's relevant to the community. So that's sort of how, how the three things tie together in terms of what we're uh, how we're approaching this problem. Um, so in short, we're really trying to connect the people across Asia. Uh, we have ambassadors in different places. We had an ambassador in India. We haven't been fortunate enough to find get a hold of you guys. So this is a great conversation to have to understand where we can go um, from the hair. Um, we do try to publish um, newsletters. Um, we try to share videos of citizen scientists across um, the region. Uh, we have a journal, which is not a scientific journal. It's more of a community journal in terms of wanting to showcase and highlight um, projects and people who are doing great work in the region. Uh, and of course, uh, as we'll come back to, obviously trying to fill the Asia gap in the partnership. So just to sum up um, in terms of citizens inside Asia, what's next for us? It really is trying to um, reach out and understand who are the players in the region, understand what are the projects examples in Asia so that we can um, share those in much more with much more visibility. As we'll touch on one of the uh, global partnership work um, along with uh, global organizations was really trying to map projects to uh, SDG indicators. So we'll touch on that more, but to the point of what's next here is really getting more of those examples, mapping to concrete um, impact from a UN standpoint and sort of, again, promote and highlight some of that. Uh, we wanna continue to educate the communities and project leaders to so people understand how citizen science can help within the space. So this um, round table is obviously one of those activities that we're very happy to be um, part of. Um, we obviously want to be able to make the whole process of creating citizen science projects and people participating a lot easier. So it's also standardizing the process um, and making sure that project creation sort of adhere to the objectives that are necessary to promote citizen science for what it is in terms of data being trustable. Uh, and of course, as I've mentioned a few times, really creating those dialogues between communities and policymakers and statisticians. Um, I'll leave this up for a second. Um, Libby, um, should we switch over so you can talk about Australia for a little bit? I certainly will try to. I'll just see if I can share my screen. Yep. See how we go. How does that happen? So you should be able to open the share tray and then yeah. select your screen. Next to the leave option, there is a share option. Uh, if you click on that. It's I a can little up see. arrow. Aha, yeah, gotcha. I think we're there. Right, let's see if this works. Yeah, we can see it. You can see that? Lovely. So here's um, just a very quick snapshot uh, about what's happening in citizen science in Australia. I'll try and make it very brief. Uh, there's lots more to say, and please ask me any questions when we've finished. Um, like most places, I think um, citizen science here is has been largely environmental, biodiversity, ecologically based. Um, the birders are always the, the first and the greatest of the citizen science um, initiatives. So that's where we started. We've got um, Landcare here is a, is a national uh, initiative. So that goes right across the country and Streamwatch, Waterwatch, same sort of thing as you. We also have some, over the years, things have developed and we have all sorts of interesting and different sorts of citizen science going on now. Uh, cat tracker, fireballs in the sky, biohacking, um, everybody getting together to, to log a very strange looking fish. There's all sorts of things happening here. Um, this is one of our really good projects, 17 years old. 
the Australian Marine Debris Initiative. So they sort the debris, they look at the barcodes, they source where things have come from, um, and they're contributing to SDG reporting. And this is now an international project. Um, and it's a really seriously important uh, scientific project too. And what we've seen over the last couple of decades is, is things are changing and moving. And now we're getting um, projects like this from the Great Barrier Reef Foundation, where they're, they're co-designing action frameworks. They're actually working with people to do this. And also here in this particular example, um, they're getting the indigenous people involved, the First Nations people involved, not just in helping to co-design the projects and the methodologies, but also in managing and, and using the data at the end of it. And this is just an example from Victoria. Victoria is um, one of the big states in, in Australia. And these are just a selection of, of projects, which is the Environmental Protection Authority in, in Victoria looking after. So we've got several air quality monitoring ones, marine monitoring and zinc mapping. I'm not entirely sure what the zinc map mapping is about, but uh, and of course, we have particular um, circumstances in Australia. You probably remember the, the bushfires in 2019, 2020. And what was interesting was there was a great outflowing of interest in, and wishing to support and get involved and do things. And what we discovered was that the, the, the establishment, the scientific establishment, wasn't really ready for that. And they didn't have the projects and they didn't have the... Uh, the mechanisms to engage all the people. So I think that was an opportunity lost, although there's good few projects around this now and uh, things like that. So this is the Australian Citizen Science Association. We're a bit older than the Asian one. Um, I've been involved at, right from the very beginning and uh, we started in, in, I think, 2012 and then we were incorporated in 2014. So there were three um, citizen science associations there. Um, we got some funding from Inspiring Australia, which is the federal organisation to, um, to promote science. Uh, so they gave us that uh, bit of funding, which allowed us to employ a national coordinator for a couple of days a week and acts as run with a management committee. And what we have here are regional chapters. Australia is big. We're bigger than India. We don't have as many people, but we're, um, we're bigger. So it's impossible to do things from the centre. So there are chapters in each of the states um, and they, they coordinate things. Sorry. <clears throat> we have developed strategic plans, working groups and communities of practice, conferences, etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, and federal grants for citizen science projects so this is what acts is about and you'll recognize the the sentiments there i'm sure this is what's needed and and what we try and do and we're analyzing what we think the future is in terms of where citizen science goes so we have a look at uh, all sorts of different things that are going on so this is the investment that's happened very little um, if you think in, ter in terms of what we're trying to do. Um, but we have had um, Commonwealth Citizen Science Grants, two rounds of that, which uh, amount to 6.3 million. And more, more positions to do with citizen science now than there used to be, which is great. And Mindaroo is, is a philanthropic um, organisation which is helping to fund things. But the big one, uh, top right-hand corner there, is Horizon 2020. That's not an Australian um, source of funds, that's Europe. Um, and their big Horizon 2020 um, allowed lots of Australian, well, several Australian citizen science pro projects to engage with that. So that was really valuable to us. And we've helped to um, add in, develop strategies for various organizations. Um, we've written a few papers to the chief scientists, et cetera, et cetera. What we're finding is a lot more is going on through the states uh, than there is federally. But in terms of the big things, this was our conference in 2018. Professor Alexandra Caldas uh, suggested we should look at the 
the SDGs and that citizen science has a big role to play in this. I'll come back to this later, but this was um, this was really inspiring to us, um, and and we took up the challenge. And also in terms of the UNESCO Open Science recommendation, um, we're working with the Global Citizen Science uh, Partnership, and Australia has a chapter of that uh, community of practice, and we're using that to try and leverage through the policy uh, side of things. So that's that's just a, a brief run through in terms of where AXA is at the moment. So uh, how do I give the screen back to you? Can somebody take it away from me? Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. So, so uh, we're, yeah, we're going to jump back to me for a second. So um, now we're, we're with a different hat on. Um, Libby and I would go through sort of from a global perspective. Um, what's that story there? So I'm going to kick off with a little bit of more of the history, how it came about, what's its focus. Uh, and Libby is definitely going to drill into a lot more details that you guys probably be interested about in terms of where we go from here. Um, so I don't have a title slide around here. I'm just going to jump right into it. Um, just to give a little bit of context, um, this is not right at the beginning, but this is a good sort of uh, landmark um, pivot point, which is important to note. So people um, in sort of the research space is probably familiar with this article. Uh, it was published in October 2019 uh, in Nature uh, magazine. Um, it really highlighted the importance of citizen science data and how it contributes towards the SDGs. I would say is a landmark article because it came a couple of years on um, after we formed the partnership and it was really good um, sort of a signpost towards which way we should be heading as um, Libby alluded to in terms of how the UN looks at citizen science from the perspective of SDGs. So why do I bring this up as a starting point? Really, um, I guess the important thing to note here is that the UN environment is a is a massive, huge proponent of the Global Partnership. Um, one of the main reasons why we were put together is really from their support and their vision in terms of understanding citizen science and how it could relate to um, the benefit of um, working towards the SDGs. So um, I mentioned earlier in terms of the UN uh, Environment Assembly, one of, the, um, one of the activities that came out of that back in 2017, December, is the Science Policy Business Forum which will come out throughout um, the rest of this presentation around the global partnership. And just as a, a small plug, there is um, an upcoming science policy business forum coming up at the end of May. So if you are available, it's a hybrid event. So definitely join that. Um, obviously, Liv and I will have the contact. You guys can uh, try to sign up for that. But I think it's important to sort of engage yourselves in that. It really is trying to bring together, obviously, the researchers, policymakers, but most importantly, some of the private um, enterprises and businesses because you really need to have that full circle of funding uh, working towards um, putting in sort of um, the, the whole objective material. So um, I'll skip this a little bit. It's more of the data, which I think Libby touched on anyways, but the important point around this is really just the SDGs, how it's measured and how citizen science can really be applied to up to 33% of all the indicators. Um, for us in Asia, which is important is that um, without citizen science, potentially, there's only really enough professional data to monitor about 20% of the indi indicators. So with citizen science, that really helps to sort of increase that, um, obviously, as, as one of the goals. So taking back a little bit, uh, as I've already mentioned, um, the Global Partnership was really um, kickstarted um, formally more in 2017 when it was announced at the um, Science Business Policy Business Forum that we're going to be going ahead and doing this. What happened at that time was we had a, an eclectic of um, citizen scientists who came together and became a global delegation um, at the event. Um, and it was really important that, as I mentioned, UN really wanted to have a partner to work with in this regards, but it's obviously difficult for them to be able to work with a lot of localized, even regionalized um, groups. So the idea was that they really needed a partner at a global level where they could interact with and have that information and resources and objective really disseminate from top down. Um, so one of the key things you'll keep us hearing us saying is from a global partner standpoint is really we're a network of networks. The idea is really coordination uh, along with a few other objectives I'll mention uh, in terms of why we're, why we're about what, what, what the partnership is about. Um, so we are in the process of being registered and a little bit more on that. I won't go through every dot on here, but this is a quick summary of the activities that have happened over the last years. As you can see, uh, it really has started way back in 2015, not necessarily at the level of global in the sense of having the right representation uh, around the world, um, but definitely that was a starting point for when some of these activities um, were sort of the genesis for it. 
Um, and as I mentioned, one of the key points is around 2017 here. Uh, this is the Environment Assembly 3 and the Science Policy Business Forum, as I mentioned. This is when it was announced in terms of us uh, doing this as a proper global partnership with the support of uh, AXA, who Libby represents here, uh, obviously with the European Citizen Science Association, with the American Citizen Science Association, with ourselves uh, representing Asia. And there's a um, sort of a CS uh, Africa that's in the formation as well. At that point in time, South America was still forming, Middle East was forming. So some of those weren't represented at the beginning, but that is some of the work that we're doing to help those developing associations come on board as well. Uh, as you can see through the timeline here, um, part of the most recent um, exercise is really we're in the process of legally forming as an entity. Um, and as part of that, an interim board has been established, which Libby and I sit on at the moment. Uh, the incorporation is going through literally the paperwork at the moment. So we're hoping, um, if not by the end of the year, this would be something that's formalized. But as a group, it's been around for quite a few years, as you can see here. Um, some pictures just um, representing some of the activities we've been in and around about. Uh, a lot of them have to do with the UN uh, around different places of the world. We've been at the Environment Assembly, we've been at the Data Forum, uh, and Libby will touch on some of those specific activities based on the groups that um, she's been part of as well. So just um, before I hand over to Libby, uh, really the five foundation of goals uh, is really helping coordinate um, CS community and global agencies, um, support the associations and the network geographic centers, uh, support and advance citizen science in multiple research areas, uh, increase the amount of open and interoperable citizen science data, and obviously enable citizen science to help deliver the SDGs and UNESCO uh, open science recommendations. Uh, that's the URL, which is pretty clear. So Libby, I'll hand over to you to go into some specifics. Let's see if I can. Maybe um, if I can just make a small intervention, please uh, try to be brief, Libby, if you can, because we also have to uh, little time for the other people as well. Thank you so much. Yes, I will try yeah. the keep to that. Okay. This is just a taster again, and uh, you'll be able to uh, have this as a reference and also ask any sort of questions. So. Network of networks, as, as we've said before, and so we, we see citizen science as developing bottom up and top down. And, and the sweet spot in citizen science is where you can find subjects that are important to people and they're nearly always place based. So this is um, an air quality project in Flanders where they were hoping for a few hundred people to be involved. And now they've got up to 50,000 people over the last five years. And that's 5% of the population. This is citizen science uh, on steroids. We've got the, um, this was designed by K King's College London. It's a COVID tracking app. And they've got 4.5 million daily participants. Um, brilliant algorithms, which are, give much better projections than the, the government than the government ones. And when they needed funding and the government wouldn't give it to them, they raised two million pounds in two weeks. And at the other end of the spectrum, we've got this, which is a wonderful project in the Amazon. There's over a hundred uh, citizen science groups down the whole of the Amazon basin. And they've been collecting information for uh, nearly 20 years on fish migrations and water quality. And this has led to some of the most sophisticated citizen science um, management that I've seen. I don't know if you know about situated openness, but it, it's a really important um, concept in terms of managing diverse groups. Um, this is the Pacific community. They can't afford, um, and they don't have a budget for science, so they do it themselves. And what you get are community-led management actions based on science. And they also contribute significantly to, to the SDGs. That's how they manage it. And this is a paper about um, contributions that citizen science can make to the SDGs. Ones in yellow are where citizen science could contribute. Ones in green are where they are contributing. So there's a long way to go yet. And the academic uh, structure around citizen science is developing rapidly. Um, this was announced a couple of weeks ago, the first GLO MSc in the world um, at University College London. You probably have heard of Muki Haklai, who's one of the leaders in citizen science. And if we're looking at citizen science policy, 
Um, the best example to look at at the moment of the power of using citizen science is the EU. This is the executive vice president of the EU talking about their next eight years and their priority priorities are health, climate and environment. And I'm sure you can agree with those. And they're saying they understand there's no way they'll achieve what they need to unless they work with the people. So citizen science is embedded in the policy of the EU and also different countries. This is Spain, the Ministry of Science and Innovation, seriously in, involved in policy, and in Germany as well. So there's just two examples, and I won't go through the common issues and, and uh, challenges. There's lots of potential, there's some issues around there, but lots of things we can work on. So this is what the Global Partnership is aiming to do. Um, and uh, I was invited to suggest areas where India might um, contribute. And I remembered this slide, which I found probably eight or nine years ago. And I was fascinated because at that time we weren't having a symposia about uh, community engagement in science, but in Hyderabad, um, that's what was going on. So I have been certain from that time until now that we have an awful lot to learn from India in terms of what you're doing in terms of citizen science. But two initiatives specifically where we really welcome Indian participation straight away, um, and one is the UNESCO recommendation on open science. And we do have a global community of practice, and we are looking to see what we can leverage out of that. Um, and I, again, I understand that you're two years ahead of um, UNESCO on this, so uh, we'd welcome your contribution there. And this implementation um, paper has just come out last week. I haven't even read it properly, but we've been invited to take part in the working groups to translate that into, um, in, into actions. And on the policy side of things, I think this is a greatest point of leverage for citizen science in a generation. Because if you read the UNESCO recommendation, it's not just about open data, it's not just about open access. Half of the, the recommendation is about the relationship between science and society. And that's where we have the expertise built up over 30 years and we can offer support to what needs to be done. And that's the bit that will be missed if we don't uh, increase our everybody's awareness of this we don't get a seat at the table when the policy responses to the recommendation are being made. And the other one is, um, this is from the Policy Business Forum, the first time it was held in Asia Pacific in October last year. And it was proposed that we develop a decadal plan for citizen science in our region. And we can't do that without India. So we really would like you to be involved in that as we develop it. And that's it for me. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks a lot, Libby. Yes, Devansha. Thank you, Libby uh, and Mendel for this wonderful presentation. Uh, we hope that from today's discussion, we would be able to take forward uh, citizen science uh, projects and approaches in India and also would be able to build a framework so that uh, citizen science approach and projects can be taken forward. And also, thanks for highlighting how citizen science can uh, contribute towards the SDGs. So uh, uh, today we have with us many distinguished experts who will shed light on how to take citizen science forward in India. In our next session, we have speakers who are practitioners of citizen science projects in India. So I welcome you all to this discussion. I would request our speakers to brief about their projects and also to highlight the different challenges that they face uh, uh, in pursuing citizen science in India and also to highlight the policy interventions that are required. I would also request them to share their thoughts on building a citizen science, <laughs> science network in India. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to invite our first speaker. So we would go alphabetically here. So our first speaker is Dr. Ananda Hota. He is Assistant Professor, Center for Excellence in Basic Science, Mumbai University. He has also established a nationwide inter-university citizen science research startup named Red at, a, at Home Astronomy Collaboratory. 
So I uh, welcome you, Dr. Vota. Over to you. Maybe one second, uh, Devanjana. Uh, uh, Libby, could you please stop sharing your screen if that's okay? I'd love to. Yes. <laughs> Is that better? Uh, not yet. Can, can somebody else take it? Yes, it's done. Thank oh. you. Thank you so much. Sorry, Dr. Hota. Over to you. Sorry. Okay. Thank you very much for in, uh, bringing me into this discussion. I will speak by sharing my slides. Sure, Dr. Hota. Okay, can you see my slide? Thank you. So um, basically, it's a part of discussion, but uh, I'm putting in a presentation mode. I am, uh, as you already heard, I am working in the Center for Excellence in Basic Sciences. I have uh, launched this uh, Red at Home Citizen Science Collaboratory in 2013, associated with many institutions. Did not go detail now, but I will, in a one paragraph, I will describe what it is. Red at Home Astronomy Collaboratory. The summary part is simply one statement if you can take it. Big data is a big resource for development. If citizen science follows a collaboratory approach, that's what is our belief. Red at Home is a nationwide inter-university collaboratory of professional astronomers, trained citizen scientists, and technical and administrative facilitators. It is the only Indian citizen science research platform in astronomy which uses Indian telescopes. Nearly 30 institutes and similar number of professionals have contributed to its growth since 2013. In a flying pyramid model, scientists and facilitators are its wings. A large number of trained citizen scientists, what we call e astronomer and i astronomers, at multiple level of expertise make the multi-layer pyramid. It has 165 e astronomers and 1,000 plus i astronomers, 2,000 active learners. 4,800 total members in a social media group in Facebook simply. This way, citizens achieve GMRT telescope time, co-authorship in papers on galaxy evolution, and MS or PhD selections abroad and in India, which constitute to basically all-round growth, part of the SDG that you people see. So in a single slide, I will say that it is a network of trained citizen scientists who try to discover astronomical objects, basically active galactic nuclei with active black holes from GMRT telescope data. With the help of so many different institutions that have helped in the process of training these citizens. That is why not only national institutes have recognized us, but internationally we have been recognized by various ways. I will give a link to my presentation in IU, just 10 minutes video talk. So in summary, we simply have a website where things are properly documented. We simply have a Facebook group where we actively discuss images of galaxies taken with various telescope data. And people learn from analyzing and discussing those images and creating more images to discuss further. We organize discovery camps where for seven days we give training to them how to discover and interpret and report a preliminary discovery. And then in short camps, or short workshop, one day workshop, we also train larger number of people. Obviously for seven days, accommodation and everything is free in an institute, so that only small number of people can be accommodated. But in one day, hundreds of people could be accommodated. So in that way, it created a flying pyramid model where we may be the scientific or the administrative facilitators, but there are a large number of people in different level of their expertise who are actually participating in the process of create, creating pre-discovery reports, which goes into publications. In the process, they get co-authorship and selection as I described before. So in that short summary, I can keep my link to my presentation and the YouTube videos in the chat box. What the organizers have asked us also to suggest something more. So here I have, I have my suggestions describing my challenges that I have faced being the first in something, we obviously have to face some challenges. Otherwise, every things could have happened long before. So in 15 years, India is kind of very slow 
except in natural bioscience related thing driven by ncbs in every other field we are very slow so what should be our strategic road map till 2035 that we can lead given our resources given our large country large number of people trained people we should be able to lead in many fields actually so redatom being the first citizen science in astronomy 2009 we have many experiences that we struggle to success story you can call it so challenges we faced is citizen science research i call i don't call it citizen science simply because people misunderstood it as a kind of an outreach program they don't take it seriously it's not an outreach that message should go that is what the basic challenge no policy yet for citizen science research funding proposals there is no explicitly mentioned in ever yet there is what is giving this mis mis wrong meaning in the society yet 30 institute i have been telling they have supported our training programs one day event seven day event etc but no research institute have kind of agreed yet on paper to have a regular or yearly program with us because they are kind of in self doubt mode which way this fits in so no iit icr or tf or isc except the ncbs that i described from astronomy perspective has come up adopting ccsr for a large number of trained human resource to take advantage of this huge telescope that we have largest in the world gmrt if you can create a good man machine combination it can do wonderful science scientific progress so no private company either has expressed interest my experience is mostly astronomical so uh, there may be some wrong statement if you go to environmental sciences no research infrastructure or telescope microscope kind of thing has provided large number of data large amount of data for anybody to start a citizen science program in india that kind of thing doesn't exist what so far i have been done in astronomy is gmrt's data and other telescope data we are using to interpret and publish paper it is not yet a time in indian astronomy at least that the telescope is providing the data for future things so policy intervention that i would suggest is recognize csr as a pi driven funded research project not an institutional outreach or a personal interest outreach it has to be recognized that way probably we can make it mandatory for research institutes to support citizen science or upload pits and ascii file data for people students who can use it for their education internship like projects and csr unless csr is big outcome is very poor and slow hence in my personal view temporary staffs like postdocs should not be involved in the process there is a risk there they cannot justify their productivity there it's very difficult phd began prasar as the name suggests began prasar means science popularization or citizen science research should be could be a, could have this institutions which are designed for earlier as science popularization should have permanent support start to staff to facilitate csr if there are faculties in uh, uh, recruited wonderful but faculty would become a domain expert in general they cannot serve all csr for example i cannot serve biology citizen science project i can only lend my infrastructure of the design i am only an astronomer extra basic astronomer in that sense to so decide so every mega science project in india is part of hundreds of crores several hundreds of crores india is participating in pmt or ska etc i was part of vigyan samagam so i know this thing it should have a csr component in this so csr is something like at the intersection of education outreach and research it's a wonderful thing in the mega science vision the document that were indian uh, psa office is creating right from is described there to support this kind of a model that we should have this so that the future generation who will be using this mega facilities are prepared are excited informed and inspired to be the scientist of the tomorrow even if they don't become scientist they still can contribute to the science being done today through citizen science so explicitly the last point if csr is also mentioned in the corporate social responsibility so that many small small company small private firms can start supporting it as uh, the organizers are thinking it can, the center in isc could be a resource center 
absolutely we are all we should start discussing first frequently and then we will create a network so that all the citizen science projects news of this project will launch this is the opportunity that can be spread to the people interested in so far erdhom is confined to only university students what we call abcd research in a bscb can do research with gmt data it can be anybody if i have given the human resource support i could have created for anybody also anyway there are many dozens of astronomers involved there but at the same time we have lot more to catch up as i said 15 years we have been slow in astronomy research certainly in physics of course there are hardly any other citizen science project in physics that i know of and, and uh, till 2035 we have to do something very seriously so that we can lead in many projects we have a great resources huge resources citizen science is an opportunity if we follow this kind of collaboratory models of the people involved and the scientists involved they are equally getting benefit out of it they are not just click workers they are trained citizen scientists collaborators thank you very much Thank you very much, Dr. Hota, for the policy recommendation that you have suggested. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Binoy. He is associate professor at the National Institute of Advanced Studies. His research focuses on social cognition and science communication, and bridging science communication with science education. He has uh, also coordinated uh, and coordinates a unique science uh, citizen science initiative named Student Scientists. to promote bidirectional communication between students and scientists and for joint production of knowledge so over to you dr Ho uh, dr binoy thank you very much am i audible yes you are yeah i don't have slides so what i will do that initially i will tell what i am doing then i will uh, share what are the constraints i felt during building the student scientist initiative and uh, how we are expecting this initiative to move forward so uh, uh, like uh, the the, the introducer said i work on the structural and dynamic aspects of the citizen science projects as well as i am running a citizen science project called student scientists so one of the line of work which we are focusing is we are trying to understand the collective sense making and uh, the emergence of uh, collective intelligence in citizen science initiatives because you know i feel that this is like a computation field where the computers are distributed in the society and they are sensors they are computers but they are not coordinated so what we do that on one side we are trying to understand how the system works because as some of you are familiar from one society to another society people's behavior change so is the way you are supposed to intervene also change so one of my phd student is working on this aspect because you know how the collective sense making differing from the uh, everyday sense making where an information is converted into a knowledge when scientific sense making happens it need to be in parallel or in it should be uh, uh, it should go in hand in hand with the scientific canonical scientific explanation so we are trying to understand that element so that phd is progressing in that line so i will tell a little bit about the student scientist initiative so i started my first citizen science in 2007 when i was a phd student that was a big failure what i did that i tried to bring the retired people of a village i am from a rural region i was doing my phd in a rural region i tried to bring all the, the retired people from that village to a nearby college so that you know they can share the information with the children because in college students requires guidance support which they rarely get other side there is demand there is uh, demand for such kind of opportunities but there is no opportunity available so we were able to collect 25 people like that from different aspects and i tried to connect it with the college where i was doing my phd and uh, for one year the program run well many interesting findings come out then it failed so just after my phd i joined in a college and i decided to convert it into a more scientific form where the citizens the science initiative called student science originated so one of the problem which you people noticed is you start a citizen science and it will not sustain after some time so you put a set of information that information will go to degrade like your atomic uh, molecular atomic things in a limited number of time so what i did that 
I took one college, starting from a college, and I made a group there by collecting first year, second year, final year students. So that the system is almost sustainable because the first year student and second year student and final year student, and up to the time the first year student reaches the final year student, the system may get a little bit stability. So then in order to collect the information, so there are two, two, two major objectives for the citizen sciences. One is collecting information, processing information, and communicating information. So for collecting information, I found that if you put the position of the houses of school children attending a, co attending a school, you can cover that village easily. So like, you know, it spreads, collects information from every side. So you have a sensor there. Now what do you need? You need somebody to direct them. So school teachers and college teachers, they don't have time. So what we did that we connected schools with colleges. So keeping college as a hub and schools as folks, we developed a model where school children will be connect, working with the college children because you know two different levels of knowledge. And we found researchers from National Institute of Advanced Studies. At that time, I got a collaboration with them. I was not a, a part of NIAS at that time. So then they said they can provide the scientific input. So then we did a first experiment that was for tracing the biodiversity in an area. In the first phase, we failed again. The reason was there was no familiarity between the stakeholders. When a college children come to school, they are not familiar. So the system don't continue. Initial hype will be there, like our first speaker said. If you conduct a science show, people will be coming there. But the science show does not continue into a science system. So then we found that if you can use the students who were alumni of the school now studying in the college, you can solve that issue. So what they did that we they worked as the connecting links. So in the second phase, we got our first success. We were able to connect around 15 schools with three colleges and one research institution that was National Institute of Advanced Studies. In the second phase, I got some support from DST, uh, NCSTSC. We did it in Karnataka and Kerala. Kerala, we started around nine uh, centers like that, but the target, the focus changed because biodiversity, what happened that when we started the biodiversity uh, studies, after some time, students started to complain that, uh, you know, school children, they were not ready to discuss many things with the college students. You know, they and some of the students started teasing them. You are walking behind and squirrel and all that. And they left back from the system. That's what I'm saying. You should have a clear cut idea how the system works. So then the third level, what we did that, this got a stability and it is working now and, and until the time of COVID. So this was one of the unique initiatives we did. Along with that, uh, so in the second phase, what happened that in order to avoid this issue of uh, uh, you know, students from non-science background or non-biology background working, we changed the topic to water. Everybody has something to say about water. So if, no matter if it's a social scientist, scientist, they were, they were studying, they are ready to work on water. That project continued up to COVID. After COVID, we didn't go back because, you know, schools and colleges were not functional. And we were working with a Facebook page called Student Scientist. You can see that. So parallelly, another citizen science activity I did was to predict the outbreak of dengue. So that's again a published paper. So, you know, the problem with uh, this kind of uh, prediction of outbreaks, again, pre-COVID time, paper came in 2019. The problem is that uh, you don't get the grassroots level data. So again, the system, what we did that, we came out with, we moved to the next level, we started using apps. So we developed two apps and it was a 10 institution collaboration project starting from St. Louis, IAD, uh, that, every, uh, that. And we came out with a new idea called Mosquito Perception Index. Then you want to understand how much mosquito is there in an area. But you cannot do the survey like that. So we trained an undergraduate college students in such a way that because, you know, the college students, if there is no demand, whatever knowledge you give, they are not going to accept that. So what we talked to them was that we could support them to complete their BSc project. Teachers were happy, students were happy, college management were happy, we were also happy, win-win situation. So what we did that we developed the mosquito tra the, the traps, the OV traps, distributed amongst the students, and they went to their areas. Then we gave the next thing that is an app. Because you know you need to collect the information. So then in the initial level, we started getting the data. 
and this was before our before our arugya setu the government of india's app and uh, that app is still there in the beta level up to that arugya setu came and uh, our app which is a very small one didn't get much attention so these are the experiments i did with the student citizen science so another line we are now developing is for the disaster risk prediction and disaster risk communication for the coastal regions because currently uh, i one of my phd students is studying how disaster risk communication can be made effective in india without people on the ground you cannot do anything that so we are also trying to develop a model like that by involving local public who is a collector of information as well as a communicator of information so i feel one of the problem which citizen science people are struggling is me many times we jump into the system without knowing the nature of the system and we tell them you do it for us obviously the question will be coming why we should do this for them, for you so in our first citizen science the students ask me if i spend around 2 weeks walking behind the your squirrels rats and all that what i am going to get what reward you will be giving to me so they said ncc students are getting rewards ns students are getting rewards so even the uh, the name student scientist came from that because earlier it was called student network so then i found that you are given the tools of the scientist because i had in much money to reward them and that system also does not works so we should understand what reward they will be getting mosquito project they were very happy because you know they found that yeah, if we contribute we will have less mosquito bites so third point is how to sustain the system because after some time the system dies naturally so we need to know any system and if it is a if it is a multi stakeholder system with connections you need to have an agency in actively so this is a passive system you know passive system means it will go to its natural state that means nobody will be coming to your program so you have to actively maintain the system how that active cohesion factor could be brought that is another element you have to we will have to discuss about ha huh, that's all from my side if you want to dis to discuss more about to know more about all this kind of experiments i can tell you that we this is our 11th year in the field and we have our representation in eight states of india thank you dr vinay thank you for sharing your rich experience uh, surely we'll get back to you uh, our next speaker is dr disha savant she is assistant program uh, manager with pune knowledge cluster she works on citizen science program and environment vertical so over to you dr savant yeah uh, thanks uh, maybe i can just show a couple of slides to introduce the projects and then comment on my thoughts so i'm opening the uh, share tray but i can't find my presentation can anyone help, help me with this uh, uh can you find this option called windows like yeah uh, ah okay click on the great thing. got it got it thanks sorry i'm new to the teams uh, platform pardon me for that okay so are the slide uh, visible yes yes they are Okay, so first of all, I thank the organizers and all the esteemed uh, roundtable uh, members uh, for having the discussion. I'm thrilled to be joining here. So I come from Pune Knowledge Cluster. I personally have a training and PhD in astrophysics, which is why uh, I decided to start uh, the journey of citizen science in Pune Knowledge Cluster using very simple galaxy images. So this is the first project that is going on currently. It's called One Million Galaxies (OMG). so what you see here it's a screenshot of the web page you can see we have only asked the citizens to match features this program may seem a little similar to zooniverse's galaxy zoo where based on the shapes of the galaxy citizens are classifying uh, the galaxy types but here we go one notch up we are providing them a uh, slightly nuanced images from 8.2 meter telescope of subaru and the idea here is for citizens to draw the features and not just the shape and the question can be very similar a uh, very simple we just ask them to match the feature and pick the uh, options which are uh, present in the galaxy shown to them uh, since we just don't want uh, their um, response in terms of statistics we also want them to contribute intellectually 
uh, we give them uh, the training via Zoom sessions and they are archived on our website as well as on YouTube. And we also have a blog page where people ask questions. And the, uh, another aspect that I would like to highlight is in order to consider citizens as intellectually important uh, entities, we are also asking them to mention unlisted features. A lot of the times in our observations, what we have found is when we project such uh, programs to citizens, they may get intimidated. They may think that it is some, some sort of a difficult rocket science. They don't understand these things. So it is absolutely essential to keep the interface very, very simple. And uh, the interaction that they do is very smooth. So they just have to click on a few options. It is something like an online form or a Google form. And that's it. So based on this, our idea is to generate a training set for AI algorithms and then eventually analyze big data using those AI algorithms. So this is one uh, project that we uh, host online. It is open worldwide. So far, we have received around 1,200 participants. Most of them come from India, but a few from abroad. And also, so far, we have uh, recorded around 72,000 Galaxy features. So currently, we are in process of publishing the paper based on the analysis. And later on, we will be developing the AI algorithm. Then, uh, OK, I move to the next slide. OK. So another project which is more environment uh, oriented is Connect3. In Connect3, what we are trying to do, uh, there is this online platform. And if in your city or in your town, the uh, municipal corporations or the civic bodies have planted saplings over uh, roadsides or over the common public areas, we are mapping them on the platform and we are opening them for adoption. So the adoption here can be in two ways. You, you can uh, adopt uh, by donating money, by providing a bamboo uh, made eco-friendly tree guard around it or in kind. In the sense, if you cannot uh, provide money, you can just uh, open the web interface uh, while you are at the sapling, while you are at the location. It is a GPS enabled app and you can collect data for that sapling. So here we want very specific data as we do uh, tree growth modeling based on these data collections. Uh, as you can see here, uh, in, in case of uploading sapling, also we have tried to keep the interface very, very simple. We provide uh, them training. Sorry to interrupt you, Dr. Savant. I think yeah. your slides aren't moving. Uh, no, are you still in okay. first slide? No, I think no. you I have actually moved uh, to the second. Yeah, do you see the connect tree uh, slide oh. now? Uh, no, it's not. Oh, okay. Just are you here. showing the correct screen? We can yeah. see. Oh, there yeah, go. yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. It's so connect. I'll just do. I'll no, no, no. From. It's it's the second slide now. Connect tree. Yeah. Fine. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I just think. To... Okay. Is this better? Uh, rather than the full screen. Right. Okay. So is this better? Is it visible? You can make out things, like right? right? Yeah, it's better now. Yeah. Okay. So the whole point here was that uh, if the civic body or government body in your area or region has planted saplings. They uh, get to us with the data in the sense that we have planted 250 saplings in the roadside out of your uh, outside your colony and so on. And our app provides the platform for citizens to record data on it. Here, the citizens can uh, contribute both in donations or in data collection. So as you can see here, the map uh, wherever you are, uh, map just takes your GPS location and shows you the plantation that has been done and to keep things very simple upload a sapling uh, form is cu uh, curated here citizens all they have to do is based on simple training and a pdf document that is shared with them via whatsapp or mail they can recognize this tree species and tell us various attributes which are associated with that sapling so here the idea is to measure the tree growth and eventually come up with a plantation model for various civic bodies based on uh, environmental biases and nativities of species. So uh, while conducting such projects under Pune Knowledge Cluster, uh, we made a few observations. So uh, if, we were, if we were to start with 1 million galaxies, we realized that in order to first invite citizens, the uh, projects have to be very easy and enticing, mostly to do with images or fancy glamorous scientific ideas and so on, which is why we chose galaxy images. And we also need to uh, sort of make, uh, give them respect in terms of not just headcount, but take their uh, 
feedback seriously because a lot of the times we also notice that citizens tend to lose interest thinking that uh, the citizen science project is uh, happening at some rocket science level and we are not up for it or we are not really intelligent enough to participate so we made a point that on the website there is a serious dialogue developed uh, via a blog page or uh, as well as a, a help desk uh, whatsapp group we take our citizens feedback very seriously and keep on tweaking the website uh, in order to start a web based citizen science projects we always made a point to initiate the projects using science enthusiasts or in this case amateur astronomers because they are the perfect link between common citizens and scientists they understand how things work at both the domains uh, also easier the online interface as i said more the citizens enjoy it and quicker the words also spread in order to keep the momentum going uh, since uh, i would like to mention here earlier also uh, the speakers mentioned that they have been doing this for years so we are uh, comparatively nascent in this uh, domain we had just uh, started this last year in august so uh, to keep the momentum going uh, we are arranging contests and quizzes on the platform from time to time we also encourage citizens by giving them participation certificates social media mentions and of course now the smart citizens will be featured and credited in our scientific publications so coming to policy and resources uh, what i felt at a local level if i were to uh, uh, communicate my needs with uh, government bodies or let's say dst or iisc i would uh, like a networking online platform where all the citizen science projects are curated just uh, as libby was showing that how they have a network in australia or how mendel show that all the uh, projects can be found at one portal that kind of a platform is very much required both at national and international level for featuring indian projects as well as a dashboard for organizers scientists and citizens so this dashboard can be a very uh, encouraging platform where a citizen a science organizers have a healthy competitive spirit where they see how each project is progressing and also the scientists get to see what kind of projects are held what kind of interface uh, is getting played with they can suggest projects citizens can come and visit the website and so on and in this way uh, we would also like to uh, invite more tech savvy citizens or let's say people uh, who have backgrounds in web development or algorithm developments and so on in some way this can be a community based platform uh, on a nation national scale or a uh, international scale where we sort of promote employability of course if funds are available and also imbibe scientific temper so uh, having said that i stop my presentation and uh, uh, i stop here thank you thank you thank you dr savant for for your recommendations uh, our next speaker is dr kunte is he back uh, dr kunte will you be able to take now uh let me ask you can you hear me all right yeah yeah i can okay okay yeah so, so uh, doctor so just give me one second to introduce you uh dr krishna meg kunte is associate professor at national center for biological sciences his research interest includes national uh, natural selection theory genetics population and community ecology and conservation biology He runs the biodiversity lab at NCBS and is the principal investigator there. So over to you, Dr. Kunte. All right, great. Uh, thanks for inviting me for this uh, roundtable. And in the beginning, I wasn't sure exactly who the uh, who the uh, audience is going to be, and then I realized uh, after I checked email, I'm on a long field trip, and I realized it was just us who. are participating in citizens projects and uh, other kinds of compilations so what i'm going to do is i'm going to very quickly share you uh, the screen from my second account i'm speaking from the phone but i will share screen from the laptop so that you can see the screen a little bit better so let me go to sharing Okay, I hope that you can see my screen now. Um, 
I'll just very briefly introduce our uh, citizen science efforts over the last 13 years. Uh, right now, everything is organized under this umbrella project called Biodiversity Atlas India, but we really started as a Butterflies of India website, which is at iphonebutterflies.org. I'll uh, take you to that shortly. So what we do here at Biodiversity Atlas India, this is one of the only two national uh, biodiversity citizen science websites. And uh, what we really like to do is we like to uh, monitor biodiversity and document biodiversity across India's biodiversity hotspots using citizen science and of course biodiversity informatics, which we use for outreach and education as well. So there are three main components, research, outreach and education. And under outreach, I will actually include uh, all the data that we communicate with forest departments as well, which then goes into management plans of sanctuaries and uh, uh, national parks and so on and so forth. So I will skip uh, some of these parts, but it's basically a powerful citizens uh, natural history web platform for species based bioinformatics. So in some sense, this is slightly different from uh, the popular citizen science uh, platforms such as iNaturalist because we run completely at species pages rather than observation based uh, platform. And I'll explain what we mean by species based platform where we organize all the information. One of the uh, main um, distinctions of our citizen science platform is that all the data that we put on our websites is already peer reviewed, which is again a big contrast to what happens on iNaturalist, eBird, Living uh, uh, Atlas of Australia and other big projects where uh, observations get posted on uh, those platforms. And then of course, eBird has a very good community, a very strong community which helps identify uh, observations pretty quickly. We use the model where we actually uh, review all the observations first, and then uh, after these are reviewed, peer reviewed, we put them online. Currently, we have eight websites. Biodiversity of India, uh, Butterflies of India is the oldest one, which we started in 2010, early 2010, and we have just moved on to a new platform. I'll introduce that to you. But when uh, Butterflies of India became really successful, people started asking us, why don't you have moths? Why don't you have dragonflies and so on and so forth? So now we have these eight websites, mostly uh, several insect groups and a few uh, uh, vertebrate groups, out of which butterflies, moths, odonata, and amphibian and reptile websites are doing really, really well. There are very strong communities in India which contribute data to these websites, but even others like Cicada is slightly more specialized. Not too many people uh, photograph cicadas or even bought cicadas. And photographing mammals is a little bit hard, so there are fewer contributions there. But those communities are also pretty strong. So what I'll do now is I'll quickly take you to the uh, Butterflies of India website, ifoundbutterflies.org, our oldest website, which also has the maximum number of uh, data points there. And we are currently including uh, the new data from our mobile app and monitoring uh, scheme, which has been monitoring butterflies in India for the last 10 years. We have nearly 400,000 observations on Indian butterflies so far. And our mobile app just launched uh, last month, uh, late last month, I think. So with that, we are hoping that we'll hopefully get to millions of observations in a relatively short amount of time. Um, <clears throat> So this is our website. Um, here you can see various um, uh, features. We do tend to engage quite a bit with uh, citizen scientists, and one of the uh, interesting ways to do this is to have features like species of the day, latest contributions. These are all clickable links. You can go to these uh, links easily. There is introduction. We have website by the numbers. We have uh, uh, nearly 100,000 observations with more than 1.25 uh, or rather 125,000 uh, observation uh, uh, images on the website. But we have a lot more non-image based data as well from butterfly monitoring. This is a completely indigenous platform. It's homegrown citizen science platform uh, hosted in the National Research Institute and of course custom built for all the things that we do in India. And this is really the most comprehensive database of Indian butterflies, which not only compiles spatiotemporal uh, data similar to iNaturalist, but we also have pretty large data set on 
early stages of bird of flies, caterpillars, eggs, caterpillars, pupae, and then uh, predation events on bird of flies, um, seasonal occurrence of various uh, stages of bird of flies, and so on and so forth. We, of course, have the mobile app. These, this is the spread of our data, which shows that in India, most of the citizen scientists are concentrated in certain areas. You don't have too many in the Northwest, for example. This is a very common pattern across different citizen science platforms. And we are trying to fill in um, these gaps where more and more people from these areas could potentially contribute. But another interesting thing is that if you look at the contributors, all these, uh, let me zoom in actually a little bit so that you can see this a little bit better. So a lot of these observations in the Northeast and in the Western Ghats, two uh, of our biggest biodiversity hotspots, are actually contributed from only a few cities. So in uh, places like Bangalore, Pune, New Delhi, Kolkata, we have a lot of citizen scientists who go to all these biodiversity hotspots to watch butterflies. And that is why we have so many records, but we don't have local citizen scientists from all these places. So we are trying to fill in these gaps and our mobile app should help tremendously with that effort. But this is uh, in terms of policy and in terms of uh, long term growth. One of the main things that we want to do is uh, focus our attention on all these cities in these areas which are underrepresented so that we get data from those areas as well. And we would like to uh, collect data from all over India as most people uh, would like for this kind of projects. And then we have contributor of the month, contributor of the year kind of uh, uh, posts which encourage people to contribute more. Anyway, I won't go through all the uh, different uh, things, but these are some of the participating institutions. We have uh, representatives from uh, at least three of these in today's meeting. And uh, you can find out more online. This is ifoundbutterflies.org. What I'll very quickly do is I'll take you to um, let's say the plain tiger uh, butterfly, which is one of the commonest butterflies in India. And when we say we are a, a species based platform, a species page based platform, unlike iNaturalist or uh, India Biodiversity Portal, for example, our observations are not standalone. You, do, you won't just see an observation on a uh, page and then that is uh, somewhat disconnected from the species page. What we have is um, a species page under which all the observations are organized. So this is a much more structured way to organize all the citizen science data. And here you can just go through all the different images to look at uh, variation much more easily than from uh, an observation uh, based platform such as iNaturalist. And you can of course uh, open this up. You can uh, scroll through this very quickly if you are looking for certain kinds of information. And of course, all of this is uh, put on a distribution map. If you go to this, you will see the distribution map uh, similar to the one I showed you earlier. But when I say that we are not a, um, a regular citizen science platform, but we're uh, species based, we have information passed out under different tabs on each one of the pages. So in Butterflies of India, we have uh, more than 1000 pages. Total across all the platforms, we have, um, I think, nearly seven or 8,000 pages. And here, information on X caterpillars, pupae of butterflies are uh, organized under early stages. So you can see all different uh, aspects, including parasitism that happens on these, uh, uh, on these butterflies. In fact, you will see that this is a uh, uh, pupa of a tachinid fly. Tachinids are one of the main groups which parasitize plain tigers. So it's not just information. Of, oh, by the way, uh, this is a braconid uh, uh, parasitoid. Again, coming out of the pupa. This is a wasp which has just punched a hole. It grew inside this pupa and it has punched a hole and just uh, emerged. Instead of a butterfly, a wasp has emerged from the caterpillar and the pupa that it uh, that was made. So we have a uh, focus on the entire biologic biology of butterflies and not just spatiotemporal data. And that's again a fairly unique feature. One of the main things that we have realized is that if citizen science data need to be useful for a broad uh, section of society, it needs to engage people with various kinds of biology of organisms 
not just spatiotemporal data. It also needs to connect with conservation concerns, with outreach programs that multiple groups are doing. So we have local projects where people can uh, have a page describing their activities along with uh, contributing observations, which is a feature not commonly found. iNaturalist has it, has it, but we give much more information, including how to contribute to those projects and so on and so forth. So this is how our platform is, uh, is organized. And the new uh, mobile app that we have just launched uh, has, it's sort of a combination of what eBird and uh, Merlin does for birds. It's an integrated app where you can use it as a field guide. It works online as well as offline. If you have time, uh, I can also quickly uh, show it to you. It's on Google Play right now. We haven't released the um, uh, iOS version yet, but at least we have uh, the Android version, which is working really well. I'm actually in the field right now, and I'm using that uh, for our 30 minute counts. So this app is a good mobile field guide plus a data contribution system where we have structured uh, everything in 30 minute counts. That's a standard method that we use nowadays. Um, Dr. Namdev and uh, Dave, do we have uh, maybe a minute so that I can just put up the app so that um, you will see what it looks like or? Uh, if I may, I'll go through it separately. We are really running short on time. If, uh, that's All right. Fine, thank, but thank you. The so website you can see more about the app and get the link. Uh, so that this is the kind of websites we have, and all the eight websites okay. run on the same core uh, uh, platform. All the websites uh, have similar features to what I showed you with butterflies. So that is the uh, platform. I, I think somebody is speaking in the background. Uh, anyway, I'll stop here and later on uh, I'll share links to our various websites, including the Biodiversity Atlas India, our uh, uh, mothership of all the citizen science projects. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Punte. Uh, it was really delighting. Our uh, next speaker is Professor Pankaj Sikh Saraya. Uh, he is Associate Professor at Center for Technology Alternatives for Rural Areas, IIT Bombay. His main research area lies in, at the inter intersection of environment, science, society, and technology. He is author of many books and research articles which focuses on different issues of the environment and wildlife conservation, and also the complex relationship between science and technology and society. So what to you, Professor Sikh Saraya? Yeah, uh, good evening. Am I audible? Yes, you yeah, are. Uh, good evening. Yeah, thank you very much. I'll, I'll brief and I will uh, just approach this whole thing from a very different and almost an opposite kind of trajectory. Uh, so some of the work that, uh, so uh, let me put it this way. I am as interested, say, in birds as I'm interested in the characters who do birding and who do citizen science. So uh, my main area of work actually is the sociology of science and technology. So I, I approach, uh, so that was, that, that was my PhD work. And we, uh, three years ago, we published a kind of report uh, which studied a few of the citizen science projects in India uh, from the social science and anthropology kind of perspective. So it, it was re very recently, the paper has been published recently in Dialogue, the same uh, journal that Suresh uh, mentioned. Now the problem is that social scientists get into the race when the scientists have already finished it. So we are always uh, lagging behind. We're trying to understand what all of you are doing. Uh, but uh, so my, my, my interests, like I said, are as much in the birds, for instance, I've, be, I've been a very keen birder as uh, in the bird watchers and the people who do citizen science. So some of the uh, panelists over here, Suhail, Krishnamek, these were parts, these were uh, subjects of the study that we did. Uh, uh, and we published in 2019 as a, as a report and then more recently as a paper. So my, my questions will come from a very different perspective and uh, I, I just lay out some of those questions uh, as a sample of the kind of things I'm interested in. So. First question, I mean, and this is the question that we ask the citizen science coordinators, not the citizen scientists. Who is the citizen? And uh, what does citizenship mean? I mean, 
Do any citizen science projects ask that question? And I'm not saying it's important to be asked. Then what is science? I mean, uh, so then what happens when citizen and science comes together? Uh, so I'm just going to throw out a whole set of questions that I think are very important, which also comes from a perspective of being, if not <laughs> technology and, uh, and science pessimism, but certainly uh, being an agnostic. Uh, if you're critically going to look at what science and technology are doing. So uh, who is this person who's interested in doing citizen science? Is it really the citizen? Uh, so if if it is about citizenship, it's about citizen. Then for me, uh, as a person who studied engineering, studied society and the intersection between society and science and technology, where is the messiness? Society is a very, very messy uh, uh, entity, to put it simply, and certainly in the Indian context. So if we are going to have one policy, one framework, one understanding, it all comes across very clean, very neat. Who really wants citizen science? I mean, uh, so I get worried when the larger institutions, whether state or scientific or academic, I, I might use a strong word, will capture this idea of citizen science. Is it a co-option? So is the citizen scientist, whoever that entity is, is, and, and this is the, I think the most uh, unfair criticism of citizen science. Let me also say that I'm, I'm a great supporter of citizen science here. But is that individual citizen just becoming a convenient, cheap data point? And what is to say that he or she is not? Uh, and I'm not saying that that is, uh, that is the truth, but I want to ask that question. I want to ask that question if, if that question is being asked. It's also, I think, very interesting, the terminology. Uh, in India, we have a huge uh, history of community science, of public science. Now, is public science and community science the same as citizen science? Is it a uh, is it a coincidence of the category of the citizens as against the category of the public or the community? It is, and I don't think it's a, because we studied a little bit of the history in the paper that we wrote, and you know the the idea emerges in a certain context. So. All the associations that Libby also spoke about in Australia, Europe, and America emerge, you know, at a certain moment. It's almost the same year as it were. The term comes into being at a particular moment, and one's of course not ascribing any conspiracy. But what what is happening? Why is that happening? Uh, how come it is the early to, to uh, 2010s that all of these things are coming together? If you look at Alan Irwin's book, when he speaks, speaks about citizen science. When does citizen science enter the Oxford Dictionary, for example, as a term? Now, these are patterns that are going to engage with, uh, they have to engage. So where is the messiness? Where is the politics? So, you know, all that we are doing here is SDG goals, national policies. So there is a set agenda, if I might be a little subversive and say, the set agenda is there and citizens are expected via these media, via these platforms to contribute towards this. Who will question the state science? Who will question the state? Uh, who will question uh, the formal institutional science and technology? And there are some very interesting examples uh, of what we studied, and they might be in other parts of the world, who follow a very similar methodology of what we might prescribe or ascribe to a citizen science. But uh, they call it something else. They don't want to call it citizen science. So, you know, I, I just kind of, uh, just leave with a couple of more questions and then I'll I'll just leave it because uh, you know the, the example that Disha mentioned without uh, referring I, I not it's not about that particular project but can will citizen science become a mode to allow the state and scientific institutions to actually abdicate responsibility now if the state is going to be doing a tree plantation program which is its mandate and if the trees are dying it's very convenient to, to have citizens come and you know uh, give them this idea that you're doing a great contribution and then they'll go and document and I think it's great it'll happen that way and we can hold the state accountable but the other side of the coin is that we're also allowing them to abdicate their responsibility because we're not questioning what they're supposed to be doing we're actually stepping in as citizens uh, so we have to acknowledge that the state fails over there and that example uh, Disha is not about the example that you're giving but conceptually is what I'm trying to ask so so what is is there even, and I'll, I'll just leave it at that, what is even a common understanding of citizen science? Uh, I mean, do, do we agree by what we mean? And maybe we don't have to, but do we acknowledge 
and I'm sure we do, that there are many, many citizen science. Because one thing that emerges, and I'll, I'll just finish here, at least in the little study we did, was the idea of voluntary contribution uh, is very central to the idea of citizen science. But when you start to probe deeper, what do we mean by voluntarity? Is it only about financial incentive? What about giving a cap or a T-shirt? What about you know inducing a citizen to participate with the authorship? There's nothing wrong with it. But then is it voluntary in the sense as we believe voluntary to be? Then it is not voluntary. But then is it citizen science? Because citizen science, so we go around in circles in that way. And that's why maybe it may not be very helpful. Uh, but I think these questions uh, have to be asked very critically. They have to be right up there. Otherwise, this is just going to be one more thing uh, because we are invoking those very, very, very attractive ideas of uh, decentralization, democratization, etc., which I'm sure many of us believe in. I'm not saying that we we don't believe in that. But just making technologies available, making apps available, having 20,000 and 200,000 people contributing data does not really mean de decentralization, does not mean uh, uh, democratization. So uh, for whatever it's worth, I mean, and I, I'm continuing to doing that kind of work. So at some point, I'll just come back to all of you and say, OK, you are now my subjects of research. Uh, because of course, this community constitutes the research, and, and that's absolutely how it should be. Uh, if we had more studies of sociology and anthropology of science, I think uh, we can we can bring out a lot more insights into how science also happens, into how uh, it impacts and how it is impacted. Because the science, technology, society relationships, I think, are much more complex uh, than we than we tend to make. And uh, you know, that's the sense I I also get in the way citizen science is going. So I, I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much for hearing me out and bearing me out. And uh, thanks a lot for actually having invited me for this conversation as well. Thanks a lot, uh, Suresh. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Saik Saraya, for raising these pertinent questions. Uh, we have a lot to think over. Uh, next speaker is uh, Mr. Raghuvanj Saxena. He is CEO of Coach Institute India. He has vast experience in the field of nature conservation, sustainability, and natural resource management. He has led several projects in diverse, uh, diversified areas, including community science projects to build an interface between science and society, and also to help develop scientific temper. So over to you, Mr. Saxena. Thank you, Dr. Day, and uh, thanks to the organizers, Dr. Namdev, Dr. Mamita, for inviting me. I'll be very brief indeed. Uh, because the paucity of time. Uh, Oxford Institute India has experience of designing, developing and implementing citizen science projects and programs. We also fund and support uh, such programs. We normally look at programs after 10 years, a uh, little longer duration. It's starting from species to the landscapes, whether it's the lakes, water bodies, marine ecosystem, forests, we are increasingly also now working on projects on energy and climate watch, also expanding into health as well. Now, uh, my uh, I have just uh, three points to make, uh, which may be of interest to you. One is that uh, the perception that uh, not much is happening on citizen science is not right. There is a lot of work happening on citizen science. There's a need to document it. And one of the suggestions I would like to give to the organizers uh, is actually to see if we can bring about a compilation and documentation of the work which has emerged here, uh, which is linked with citizen science, which would be an inspiration and encouragement to many more who will be working in this field. Second, uh, we have a lot of interesting case studies of working with corporations and supporting them on the work on scientific social responsibility, wherein we be built in the element of uh, citizen science. Uh, I think from our country context, the potential of citizen science as a tool to bridge the gap between science and society as part of the scientific social responsibility is extremely important. And that's an area if we were to take citizen science too, we can do much more with a wide range of stakeholders. And that's the potential we must uh, explore. 
secondly we also try and work uh, to promote the voluntary potential in the scientific community to strengthen the science society linkages what we increasingly have done over the years is that look at uh, premier scientific institutions in the country and key scientists look at what they are doing on the long term research and how do we build in the component of citizen science and what is the impact of that and then we have got very interesting case studies on this very happy to share it with anyone who would like to see that i have got this uh, three uh, points to mention here i think we have to ensure that citizen science projects have genuine scientific outcomes such as do we really answer a research question do we really inform conservation action and we must try and document those projects in the country which have been able to harness this potential of citizen science so this is key to make uh, citizen science mainstream is to ensure that we properly document the project and the process where they have actually made a genuine uh, scientific outcome that kind of contribution the other is that we must involve citizen scientists uh in multiple stages not just merely for coming and collecting a data but they should also be involved uh in the in the process of actually when we develop a research question when we reserve the when we design the methods and also when we try and analyze the data and then going back from scientists to citizen scientists about communicating the end results that kind of a whole process need to be strengthened and built in to ensure that citizen science becomes mainstream in the kind of work that we do and finally my very final point is that uh, we must try and evaluate the citizen science projects from the kind of scientific output data quality that they generate and also from the experience that the participants gain from this there is a huge potential in our country to build up on citizen science and i think there is so much more that we can do with the model thank you thank you thank you very much mr saxena for your comments our next speaker is professor sardindu baduri he is an economist and associate professor at the center for studies in science policy jawaharlal nehru university he has extensively researched on frugal and grassroots innovation and technological capability over to you professor baduri thank you i hope i am audible yes yes you are thank you uh thank you uh, uh shuryesh for your invitation and it was an enlightening discussion uh and also thanks to to ankur for opening up the box a little bit which is making me feel less of an odd man out in the whole group um <laughs> uh, uh, and and uh, well my exposure to citizen science has been quite indirect i must say uh i have been associated with a project very recently to understand how india's science clubs and maker spaces uh contribute to frugal innovation research uh now frugal and grassroots innovation being innovations which are done outside the laboratories it has certain resemblance with the citizen science or the mandate of citizen science uh but definitely uh, the connection is rather fragile or rather weak uh and, and that is empirically so i don't i don't know whether it should remain so fragile uh, but that's a question i would like to ask to this group of people more engaged with the science uh, citizen science um, scholarship when we did that research we found out uh, that there are clubs for example which are affiliated to uh, the bigyan prasar uh, the science communication unit of the department of science and technology but there are also clubs which consciously try not to get affiliated with bigyan prasar because they think that that it will it will curtail their autonomy to do research of the kind that they want to do 
Now, what kind of autonomy? Because you know, one of the points that Pankaj mentioned uh, in his intervention, that uh, you know, who would criticize, for example, the state science? If the state comes up with a project, be it uh, a, a mining project, be it uh, a, a large dam project, huh? if there are criticisms to be to be realized, then who would capture those criticisms? Huh? And, and that's where some of these clubs felt that they have a responsibility to uh, the citizen by not getting affiliated with the with the state and therefore maintaining their independent. Um, you know, uh, 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 identity, so to say, right? Now, this actually is what makes the things a bit, you know, uh, complicated. And, and, and where do citizen science uh, or citizen science scholarship or activism bring such complications into its domain of analysis? It would be an interesting thing that I would like to uh, know. And, and the reason being that, you know, at the very beginning, Suresh mentioned uh, that the objective is to come up with a policy or a framework which would reflect the realities of India. Now, uh, now if that is indeed the objective, then I think these complications are uh, should be an integral part of it. Uh, coming to my second point, what I feel is, yes, of course, it is very fine and very enriching and enlightening to study the, the natural phenomenon like biodiversity and they're important. At the same time, being an economist or being a social scientist, I'm also sort of more worried about some of the more immediate need of the society. For example, when it comes to the matter of health, huh? when it comes to the matter of agricultural practices, when it comes to the matter of artisanal knowledge, right? Um, you know, how do we account for the vast knowledge that exists outside the laboratories? I mean, I will give you one example. Ten years ago, I was doing some research on shifting cultivation, and I I, I saw a booklet by the uh, Indian Institute of Agricultural Research, where they had categorically mentioned how bad is shifting cultivation, how unscientific it is, how how old or backdated it is, and should not be practiced. Now that version actually has undergone a sea change in the next ten years. And now there is more acceptance in the formal, you know, among the circle of the formal scientists to, to accept the practice and to see how it can be improved given the context that we are, we are observing today. So that, that, that has undergone a change. Similarly, few days ago, I think two days ago, to be more precise, I was in Calcutta. I was talking to a few scientists of the Saha Institute of Nuclear Physics. And one particular story that we are trying to understand more is what, you know, Saha Institute of Nuclear Physics was given the charge of developing an absorber for the Higgs boson project. This absorber would absorb the other articles, uh, other particles, not the Higgs boson particle, so that identifying the Higgs boson particle becomes easier. So from a crowd of particles, it would be able to absorb a few which are not the Higgs boson or which would make the identification of Higgs boson particle easier. Now, guess what? This particular machine, of course, it required a large collaboration, but one part of that machine, the larger part of the machine required a kind of mechanical engineering which the established mechanical engineering firms could not do and the institutes then had to go to a place called Haura, where I belong to also. Uh, and, and one of those informal sector firms and the artisans there developed a machine without the modern instruments of measurement. And apparently that machine was perfect and it didn't have any specification error. Now the question for me is when we look at the Indian reality, or if we want to develop a citizen science policy which would reflect the realities of India, where this vast majority of knowledge exists outside the laboratories, I mean, not in a very complementary manner. I mean, there are competing interests between these groups, as we have seen in the case of shifting cultivation, as we have seen in many agricultural practices, as we can see in the context of this artisanal uh, product I am talking about. These are illiterate people who could contribute to the SARN project, who, who would believe without being told 
specifically about such things, right? Now, question for me is, would Indian citizen science policy be able to accommodate such diverse interests, uh, which are not at all or not always, you know, has a, uh, we should not have a very compatible relationship with the, with the, with the modern, the laboratory science, uh, uh, which might have an antagonistic relationship or antagonistic interest. Right, because uh, you know the, the the question of how do you develop this? Do you follow the scientific protocol? Is the question that that laboratory science would probably ask uh, to some of these issues? But that is exactly when the citizen science might be helpful, because citizen science tells us to be more to be more uh, inclusive about methodological pluralism, right? About data pluralism. And that is where I would probably try to see a reflection uh, from the part of the DST group and other citizen science experts to see if that inclusion is possible. Now, I have just one final point, if you allow me, which is, you know, in the field of uh, the, the citizen science state networks, uh, state different developed network, which include, say, the science clubs, uh, the new auto tinkering labs, or the or the uh, you know national science centers. Now there also there are there are there is a lot of uh, uh, you know isolation among themselves, right? I mean they don't really talk to each other. Now do we think of a citizen science policy, which of course should not harmonize these spaces, which should accept these spaces as diverse spaces of activities, but can create a sense of dialogue whereby uh, you know the the citizen science activity in india reaches that critical mass in order to demand the kind of policy support from public sector as well as from private and other sectors to make it a meaningful activities that will be really engaging for the large section of the society not only the students who can understand science but even an illiterate person of course i am probably uh, being a bit uh, romantic, but that romanticism comes from the fact that, uh, you know, the grassroots innovation or frugal innovation in India have really been able to show to the world that are different kinds of methodologies are ways to ex you know, express creativity uh, exist. So uh, maybe that's where I would end and, and thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Baduri, for your uh, well articulated points for a diverse and inclusive uh, citizen science policy in India. Our last speaker is Dr. Suhail Kadir. He is program lead at National Conservation Foundation. He is trained in the field of animal ecology, but his major interest lies in engaging with people to bet, better understand the natural world and also how it is changing. So over to you, Dr. Kadir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, could you tell me how much time I have? About five minutes. Five minutes. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, to you and to the all the organizers uh, for putting this together. It's been very interesting. I um, approach uh, uh, this field from the same uh, direction as a couple of others, in, uh, biodiversity and ecology. I've been a, uh, uh, a participant in citizen science, I guess, uh, since 1987, which is before the term was coined, and um, a proponent, I suppose, uh, uh, who runs my own projects from 2007. Um, and so, as you can imagine, uh, it's a topic dear to my heart. Um, and and as Pankaj and others have said, of course, there's a lot there's a, of contention. There are various things to argue about. But I thought I'll just start by describing a little bit uh, of the sorts of projects that I've been involved in, um, and then uh, step back and see what uh, just a couple of thoughts about larger implications, at least things in my mind. Uh, so um, I, back in 2007. Um, uh, we started uh, this project uh, again. Sorry, this is again biodiversity ecology. Uh, to look at migratory uh, timings of birds. We called it Migrant Watch. Um, we built a technology platform, a very simple technology platform, admittedly, and ran it. Along the way, we also uh, did another project uh, together with the Bombay Naturalistic Society uh, called Citizen Sparrow, which was to understand what people uh, felt about, thought about, remembered about the sparrows uh, around them, 
and whether they were increasing or declining or whatever else. Um, in 2010, um, we also started a project to look at trees, uh, to look at the seasonality of trees, the timing of flowering, fruiting, and leafing of trees. Um, and the idea there was um, that uh, climate change is expected to have uh, quite an impact on the seasonality of various natural events. And uh, so seasonality is one of the sort of early uh, warning signs, or early triggers uh, that we can look at uh, the impacts of climate change. And we know that from uh, temperate regions, but there was very little information from the tropics. And so with Season Watch, again, we built our own um, uh, sort of technology, a website, app, and so on. We work largely with uh, schools, um, uh, like Benoit has done as well. Uh, we work with schools. And so, and right now there's um, several hundred, I think 600 schools and a uh, number of individual participants uh, contributing, uh, you know, uh, half a million observations of trees, not just the trees themselves, but specifically their, uh, what's, it, what's called phenophase, which is the flowering, fruiting, and leafing stage of the tree uh, throughout the year. Um, we also, a uh, third and ongoing, uh, sorry, fourth and ongoing project, uh, or, or sort of an umbrella group, is what we call Bird Count India, which is uh, a consortium of lots of uh, uh, formal and informal groups that are interested in birds, knowing more about birds and their distribution, abundance, uh, migration, and their trends over time. And uh, so BirdCon India uh, does, uh, you know, promotes uh, uh, bird watches to observe birds, upload them to a technological platform called eBird, which is which was mentioned before. Um, and we also try and uh, work with uh, bird watchers enthusiasts to sharpen their skills, to help them understand better, but also to help them um, do some of the other aspects of science, which is to be consumers of the data. So we uh, have done workshops on how to analyze the data that they can download. Um, and very importantly, and this comes back to something that Pankaj and others have said, um, we've begun, begin, begun to realize that <clears throat> um, we need to sort of move away from uh, the sort of pure top-down uh, driven uh, citizen science and really be also facilitators and enablers of um, projects and um, uh, questions that come from the gra grassroots, from, that come from the ground level. In our case, for BirdCon India, the audience is bird watchers still. Um, <clears throat> but we do workshops and we work with local birding groups to, um, to ask them what questions they have what questions they would like to answer, and then help them with the sort of more technical aspects of how they can realize uh, those ambitions. <clears throat> and one recent example of that was a Kerala bird atlas, which was conceived of and led by uh, bird watchers across the state of Kerala, with the BirdCon India providing just a sort of a bit of technical know-how, and of course eBird providing the tech platform. So, um, in the course of all this, large amounts of data have been uh, been uh, generated, uh, so I don't know, 30 million observations and so on. Um, and one outcome of this uh, data generation has been a um, uh, an effort to understand how India's birds have changed over the years, and that's uh, been possible because bird watchers have uploaded their old reports, their old records that they've written in notebooks uh, as early as the 1960s, but uh, more uh, more close to this time, 1990s to 2000s and so on. And that's enabled uh, this report called the State of India's Birds that was put together by a consortium of institutions, uh, showing uh, how uh, uh, about 867 species of birds in India, how their fortunes have fluctuated over time. And generally, they have not been doing very well, although there are some species that are doing particularly well that have increased over time, like the peafowl. This is, a, uh, I guess, this is the only nationwide data set that can show how birds across the country are doing uh, in aggregate. Um, but of course, um, oh, and sorry, before that, I should say that uh, we've also been looking at um, uh, uh, building a small community of those who are involved in citizen science projects in the field of ecology and biodiversity. And uh, in two years running, that is uh, 2020 and 21, we've uh, had uh, a conference on citizen science uh, on biodiversity in India. Um, and um, uh, so people have come and presented their work, have talked about these larger, some of these meta issues that uh, Pankaj has spoken about. And um, I can give you the link uh, to the website where uh, there's a repository of talks and so on from these conferences. Hopefully we'll have one this year as well. But we also have a directory of uh, projects on citizen science in biodiversity in India, 
uh, that lists about 26 projects uh, over there. Um, some of them, as I say, are the more top-down projects, some of the more grassroots projects, and I think we're probably missing another 10 or 15 on there, but I'll paste the link in the chat. Um, from the policy level, I think what I understand is, and has been emphasized by multiple people, that citizen science, the term, can be thought of as a big tent. In fact, this, this phrase big tent has been used in a recent publication. Uh, including all the way from conventional top-down projects to uh, to grassroots initiatives that are really um, initiated and driven from the bottom up. Uh, it encompasses uh, situations where citizens are largely passive, the participants are largely passive. For example, phones being used as sensors to detect earthquakes, uh, where the person doesn't have to do anything except download an app. All the way to being extremely active, to go out and do something different, to go out and take a photo, and let's say send it to iPhone butterflies or to go and look at saplings in Pune and so on. Um, and so I think there's, uh, if we are to use this Big Ten definition, there's uh, the, then any, any policy from uh, government or from the state will have to recognize, I feel, and accommodate this diversity rather than uh, prioritizing and privileging one or the other of these approaches. Um, I think that's, that's a sort of a fairly obvious thing to me, although given that, uh, you know, science in general and citizen science so far globally has been mostly top down, it would be nice to see a policy that encourages the more grassroots kind of work where the scientists are really not the proponents, but the scientists are, are the facilitators of uh, research or knowledge, new knowledge, let's put it that way, that grassroots groups and local groups and communities want. Uh, so there's a, it can be a different conception of what the scientist role is in this uh, as well. And policy, of course, can affect citizen science, but it's the other way around as well, ideally, that, that uh, information that comes out of citizen science, whether at the very local level, um, for example, with air pollution monitoring or uh, waste in waterways, uh, as in some countries where at the local level it should affect, uh, you know, waste disposal um, uh, management practices and policy, or at a national or global level. So there should be a space for results from these kinds of projects to affect policy. And for that, of course, the state has to relinquish amount, some amount of control. Uh, the state cannot uh, anymore sort of control the, the narrative. If we're looking at survival rate of saplings and we're doing it in a citizen science framework, then the agencies that are doing the planting need to also be open to the results uh, that are being generated by citizen science. Uh, and not only accept those results when they are uh, what they want to hear. So it's a complicated thing. I think there are many more uh, um, uh, sort of uh, people who uh, in the in India alone, but let alone globally, who uh, would need to be consulted. I think for a, a larger sort of policy uh, uh, recommendations to be put forward. Many uh, nations have their own policies on citizen science. The European Union has a, a EU-wide policy. Let's look at those as well. Uh, and I have to admit, I've not engaged very closely on that uh, in that regard. So I'll stop there. Thank you again so much. It's been very enlightening. Uh, and I'll post a couple of links in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kadir. And uh, our sincere apologies to you and also to some other speakers who have not had uh, you know enough time to convey all their thoughts. Uh, as I said, like earlier, like we would really like to be it to be like the first step and like to build up on conversation from here. So hopefully we'll have more like maybe bigger meetings and maybe in-person meetings where uh, you know we'll be able to maybe communicate better on many other things that have not been done so far in this uh, uh, you know in this event. Um, but uh, uh, now I would move towards the open discussion section where we would first go towards uh, some of uh, the other stakeholders. Uh, we wanted to have people from the from the from the government, from science academy, from a representative from NGO and a policy center and so on, and get their inputs as well. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, the DST representative uh, could not be here. He had uh, uh, he had an urgent meeting and he had to travel for that. And also, the PSA office representative had to leave early. But uh, we will be sharing all these uh, recommendations with them and uh, engaging with for, uh, engaging with them further on all of these things. Uh, now, I, I would like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Rajendra Dhaka, who is the chair of the Indian National Young Academy of Sciences, to uh, maybe share his perspective, his thoughts on whatever discussion we have had already, and uh, what are the things that he, uh, that you think, Dr. Dhaka, can be done also from the NER side, from the as a Young Science Academy, 
Can INEAS also be involved in some of the science, uh, citizen science related activities? So over to you, Dr. Tan. Thank you. Thank you, Suryas. Uh, thank, let me thank uh, Suryas for inviting me on such a wonderful platform. Uh, I'm first time on this citizen science, science platform. Uh, I have learned a lot uh, during last two hours of presentations from uh, eminent speakers. Uh, you believe me, I, I never had chance to, you know, to, to listen to such wonderful talks on citizen science. Uh, so I have learned a lot. And uh, from the INIAS side, uh, so as uh, Suryas uh, just said that uh, INIAS stands for Indian National Young Academy of Sciences. It is only the young academy in India for, for young scientists. And uh, as all of you or most of you are uh, first time on listening about INIAS, I, I guess. So let me give you a little bit about uh, INIAS. So INIAS was founded by INSA, the National, uh, Indian National Academy of Sciences uh, in New Delhi in 2015. And we are around 100 members uh, from across India, from different institutes, uh, universities, IITs, ISARs, and so on. And uh, we are from different uh, areas of basic sciences, uh, including physics, chemistry, mathematics, biology, uh, then engineering, and recently, last year, we included agriculture sciences and uh, then science communication, science policy, and science education. So I'm happy that uh, you know we are a family of you know members from diverse areas and across India. And in fact, after listening all these presentations, uh, as I said, I learned a lot, uh, and I'm sure in future we will contribute even more. But what I felt is that Inyas, in fact, is already doing and involving involved already involved in in citizen science in one way or the other uh, as uh, you know uh, let me say that uh, whatever i have understood a little bit uh, uh, from from these presentations and my limited knowledge that you know the methodology of citizen science is crowdsourcing of data from volunteers and you know for distributed observations computing and intelligence Right, and the cost and of course the timeline of projects concentrate drastically by distributing the workload volunteers receive first hand experience uh, on by working on research projects. And you know, I think we should involve more, uh, we should increase more public participation, the citizens, uh, and of course the ground level monitoring and the management of resources would benefit the citizen science uh, projects. The notion of uh, citizen science uphold a vital role, of course, in the in the era of innovation and uh, discoveries. It develops, you know, public science partnership and involves society science uh, dialogue exchange, which you know promotes science among young generation. Uh, you know, with the advent of new education policy in India, uh, the idea of, you know, having practical based theoretical knowledge, uh, this is really urgent need of the hour in India. So this target, you know, can be the successfully achieved uh, by implementing citizen science among the students from a very young age. And, you know, being able to engage uh, these young students in projects would, you know, enhance their interest, knowledge, practicality and uh, scientific concept uh, from the beginning. And of course, as we know that the implementation of such a dynamic and ideology requires vast infrastructure, but a comprehensive framework, uh, you know, will make it happen, regulate and promote scientific collaboration uh, that you know to propose and include more stakeholders to formulate the citizen science framework. And as I said in the beginning, that science academies, particularly the young academy in YAS, already working in in these areas uh, in the field of public science partnership by organizing many seminars, webinars. In fact, the project trainings to students, uh, teachers of rural areas, and so on. So all these activities have increased the opportunity and engagement of students and uh, at large public. As I said in the beginning that we have also included uh, agriculture science last year 
so we have members from agriculture sciences and they are also involved in many uh, projects uh, involving farmers for their benefit uh, from uh, you know children uh, working in the backyard to make like simple projects airplane and so on from cardboard and also you know working on innovative science projects all these will uh, you know have have the access to learn and work with uh, with advent of citizen science. So, as I said, uh, in Yas, we do lot of these activities. We are already involved in many of such uh, projects. Uh, I can give you a few examples, like uh, we have recently completed uh, one event called Sci Art Competition. So, we actually invite uh, uh, images where students can, you know, show their science in terms of uh, art images and we have concluded that uh, event recently. We also have a, a project uh, where PhD students particularly, you know, they, they record their five years of research in three minutes to tell the science or the research that they have done to a common public man. So such events, then we have training programs uh, for school students, teachers, women in science, the internship programs and so on. So I think we are already involved and uh, as uh, I'm happy that Suryas is there and uh, Dr. Meherwan from Inyas is there. So we are going to contribute more in this direction. So with this, I will stop. Uh, I think we are running out of time. So Suryas, I will stop here and we will of course continue discussing uh, in this regard. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Taka. And, uh, so we wanted to have a representative from NGO out there, so, uh, but uh, Ms. Goti, uh, Gitika Goswami had to leave. Uh, so we'll just go to uh, Dr. Meherma, who is also a scientist at uh, ISPAR, which is a science policy research institute of, uh, of CSIR, to make her his remarks about how a policy research institute like NISPAR can also contribute uh, towards the uh, science-related activities. Over to you, Dr. Wong. Thank you, Dr. Suryesh. Uh, it was really a nice learning experience for me too. Like uh, Dr. Dhaka, Dhaka mentioned, uh, it's a very new uh, for me, especially, and I could present many uh, great speakers in this uh, uh, platform. I think uh, I think uh, I, I should represent science communication here, and I think that science communication can join hands with citizen science projects much more in, in greater ways. I think uh, if we think of uh, public like India, I mean, the, 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 the diversity in public in India, uh, science communication can play a greater role in, in taking this uh, science, proje science citizen projects uh, to the public in much more, uh, I mean, much better ways. Uh, it can, I mean, have uh, answers to the questions to the people like, why should they join citizen science projects? And how will it benefit them and society at large scientifically? It can, science can, uh, SciCom can also help uh, citizen scientists to better understand the correct methodologies to, to, in, uh, to, uh, to make the project a success. I mean, such kind of questions can be answered with the help of science communication. And I would like to uh, listen to uh, Dr. Levy and others, Dr. Mendel, that uh, how science communication can join hands with with a citizen science project to make it more success. Um, thanks, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wan, and. Uh, Thank you very much for uh, those remarks. Uh, so I think uh, we uh, now we can have maybe a couple of uh, uh, like rounds of open discussion, maybe a couple of questions very quickly, and then we can uh, end the event. I would just like to invite anyone if, uh, you know, in general, if you want to comment on having like heard the points from all the speakers by now, what is that you think as a way forward, uh, if you want to build a kind of a network in India for citizen science, and uh, uh, you know what kind of features it can have, and who are the people who can take it uh, forward? Like, is there some kind of government support that is needed, uh, or 
you know scientists or, or citizen science projects by themselves can come together to uh, you know uh, take these things forward in terms of both engaging with the government also as a policy advocacy group but also uh, taking part in some of the international projects and engaging with them so uh, i would uh, uh, really request all of you uh, like if you have some suggestions or some thoughts please raise your hand and then we we'll we can discuss a little bit on that and then we'll have some final remarks then yes sir, dr binoy uh, you have uh, you are muted could you please unmute line suggestion that uh, you know the yeah. data sharing is going to become a big uh, point of discussion and the data generated by the citizen scientists available on the platform who and when it is going to be converted into a paper and if an error comes in that paper or a plagiarism comes in that paper you know that data sharing part when we cross the borders as part of citizen science need to be discussed in detail thank you thank you very much indeed very very important point i think we did not have a time to discuss this in detail uh, uh, in this round table but uh, data related practices are extremely important and uh, i think different countries are coming with very different rules on how the data is processed stored and uh, you know analyzed and all of that and uh, uh, this is something that would require i believe a much larger discussion as well so uh, i think we can uh, probably want to put it uh, as a as a as a as a point to have for the discussion in our report uh, when we submit it to government agencies and so on like this is something that we'll have to figure out uh, with uh, further uh, discussion uh, thank you so much uh, dr vinoy uh, for sharing it uh, i would next go to dr uh, kunte uh, for your remarks could be briefly say your thing uh, you are muted currently dr kunte please unmute all right um one of the points that you raised is should there be a government structure should there be what kind of structure should there be to organize this network uh, my suggestion is that uh, since you have organized this program i see clearly has this center which is going on earlier so well uh, to ncf and other organizations that also uh, organize this uh, these conferences for the last two years i think this kind of a structure where uh, there's a there is a institute supported by government but not directly a government agency might work out the best because this brings best of both the worlds there is a government support recognition of all the efforts that are being made but also uh, through institutions like isc or uh, ncbs ncf and others i think there is institutional structure which is much more dynamic which which is much more nimble we can which can respond to um, needs of citizen science platforms as well as citizen science groups so i think uh, if you are going to propose a certain kind of a structure this kind of a structure supported by the government but operated by institutions ngos might be a better model in my mind thank you thank you very much dr indeed i think uh, our center might be a well placed uh, place uh, to do this uh, Uh, currently we are our focus is a little bit not on citizen we have open science focus but citizen science so far has not been one of our main area but that is uh, something that is really becoming one like the policy aspects of citizen so uh, we would definitely try to discuss it among ourselves and how our center can be uh, you know contribute to this that effort but uh, yeah if uh, other bodies or other like better established centers including uh, you know the ones that are promoted or 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 uh, entered by ncbs i think those could also take a lead in that direction so so thank you thank you very much we we'll, uh, when we share uh, the report and like we require uh, we request for all of your comments so uh, i think this is one of the points that we can take further uh, uh, dr hota you also have your hand raised yes uh, see within just this one hour two hour three hour meeting it's difficult to come up with something concrete so i first of all i think uh, we should share each of our, our uh, presentation publications in a single place and we come to know each other's activity more formally and as if maybe in a google doc we all share our website publications with you video presentations etc that will first help us understand as a group because most of us have not communicated to each other yet i certainly have not communicated to most of the people so okay. let's first communicate each other then um, suryes so is also suggesting that when they will draft some article or some report they will be looking at that again so then probably will be able to form a 
a code of conduct or citizen science alliance in india some kind of guidelines that we have to create first yeah. then probably physically we have to meet sometime again <clears throat> only then we'll be able to discuss truly and come up with some policy statements it's too Definitely. early otherwise it's just the starting point as you say yeah yeah it's a first step <laughs> probably uh, thank you thank you very thank much you. dr Yes, uh, Mr. Saxena, you want to? Yeah, so I wanted to say that if you can uh, create a forum, a multiple forums, in fact, one could be a knowledge network platform for those who are practicing citizen science. They can communicate with each other their experiences. Then we can look at a whole forum of possible funders, supporters, organizations who who can possibly be. tapped for uh, long term support of citizen science programs it's possible but if we can do it in a structured way it helps the overall work on citizen science and third is the larger program on policies and the interventions where citizen science can play a role if if you can help create that kind of a network and forum to bring in various stakeholders it can really help the whole work in the long term definitely thank you so much uh, mr saxena and i think uh, what we can do from our center side as a very very small first step is uh, create uh, like an uh, email email group or a google group where all of us are added and then uh, like all the participants here but also like there are more people that we were not able to invite or yeah. you know we had limited time so we were not able to get in touch with all of them so we all are like at least uh, there is one email group so even we can share our publications we can share resources we can share best practices and uh, if some support is needed i think uh, those kind of discussion can go on in, in that kind of a google forum uh, you know if if that that sounds okay to all of you sure thank you uh yes uh, mental you have some remarks yeah just just more general comment um definitely i think it's been it's been great to hear everyone's viewpoints and uh, as as i mentioned in the chat I, sh i shouldn't be surprised but it's just amazing how much experience um and war stories everyone already has to share in terms of in this space so i guess back to one of my points is that it's been unfortunately i'm not sure if everyone else knows as much i kind of had had an idea how much is already going on in india but it's a little bit insular so from my perspective i can't comment too much what you guys should do in terms of a national level but in terms of some of the comments that were already made i think definitely supported by institution as government support i think it is a great way to approach it given what i've seen in other places um but from my perspective what i would obviously uh would like to see is just from a synergy standpoint is obviously maybe working with us as well so that there's a bit of more outward um sharing of what's going on here as well because from my perspective just being in asia being asian i think having that pride to know what we're doing here is it's amazing because of obviously a lot of examples you see uh, it is not in a negative way but just in terms of competitive or not just seeing a lot of examples coming from america australia europe it would be great to just see more examples coming from asia just in terms of what's going on here and just from a scientific discovery or just community practice it just be good to see like all the stuff that's going on here as well and i think india obviously have that having a history would be great from my perspective to share more so depending on who ends up centralizing being the core to this community it would be great if you can work with myself so i can help share some of this stuff um we just launched our new website and we're trying to really focus on making it multilingual so that there's more diverse support in terms of across this region but the other question around data uh, privacy as well is just sort of understanding what some of the concerns are because i guess that's where some of the 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 questions sometimes come up when it gets to that point and and as someone else mentioned it is a long much longer discussion but having data stored on a specific platform that's owned by someone that's not central that's not decentralized obviously probably comes down to become a problem in itself uh so obviously that's an aspect that i'm trying to understand as well from a regional standpoint because across all the different number of nations in asia i think a lot of those are common as in in some ways a lot of people might not necessarily want to use us tools because people feel that always oh, are really rolling up in the us government as an example so that's some of the thing i'm trying to tackle as well so yeah uh, thank you so much uh, man and yeah definitely uh, many of those concerns are very important and yeah i'm just really looking forward to more meetings like this so we can you know maybe one by one tackle some of those issues and see how we can go forward yes lipi you also have your hand yes, please go ahead my feeling is that um somehow it seems that we with other parts of the world we've managed to break down the barriers 
but India still seems to be quite siloed in terms of um, not outreaching to other things. And, and I again, I have no idea whether it would be feasible to have a, um, a national conference and just invite uh, the citizen science community to come together. That's what we've done. But obviously our country is a lot smaller than yours. But in, in a way, Europe did the same thing. They just um, set up a, a meeting, a conference and got together and, and um, had a few days at it because we've had a few hours. But um, there's obviously so much there that you're doing. Um, that only by getting together and actually having some workshopping time, having some time to, to, to get into the nub of the matter. The other thing I wanted to say was I think that the open science recommendation is something that the government will want to make a response to. And that's why I've said that I reckon it's one of the greatest points of leverage for citizen science, because citizen science should be in there. And therefore, this is an opportunity for government to find out more about what's going on and get a better understanding of the citizen science landscape in India, because it's it's very advanced. I mean, a lot of the work you're doing is extremely sophisticated and advanced. So there's a lot to understand. Yeah. Uh, Those would be yeah. Thank you so much, Livy. And one thing that I wanted to check with you and uh, also Mental, like in more practical terms, if some of the projects uh, in India, running projects of, in India of citizen science, like if they want to engage with the Global Citizen Science Partnership and also with the citizen science.asia, like how, what is the way to do it, like in very practical terms, how they can also work with some of uh, your things that are already going on? Well, just write an email and say we we are doing this or we're thinking about doing this or or and the thing is that there are lots of projects, particularly now. There's some big money coming through Europe um, that that are looking for international linkages, and I've I've been uh, I I asked people before we came here um, in the US. Um, apparently, citizen science is getting new funding. I don't know if you know about NOAA and NASA that are big working, you know, they have a lot to do with citizen science. There's, there's, they want new global um, initiatives to be happening and they'll be, be developing them soon. So actually letting people know that you want to, you're interested in collaborations. And in Europe, they're, they're actually seeking, actively seeking collaborations across international uh, spheres. So there's lots going on and you can just write uh, to Mendel and myself and, and let us know uh, if there are things that are happening or if, the, as I say, I've highlighted a couple of, of uh, issues that I would very much like uh, Indian collaboration on. The, um, the community of practice on the open science recommendation is one that I'm, I'm co-chairing that global um, community of practice but also we don't have leadership in terms of this um, Asia Pacific um, uh, decadal plan we haven't got anything so you would be coming in at the ground floor on that and as equal as anybody else in terms of what we might do so we need to set up a, a sort of a think tank around that to see how we could um, how we could work it out, how we could fund it, how we could make that happen. And we'd love to have your involvement in those things. So you've got two, two conduits here through to the global partnership, and we've got networks out to countries. So whether it's a specific kind of project or just generally, then, then we can help you find the context that you need. And I guess just to add a couple of lines. Um, so, yeah, I think in general, just you can certainly reach out by email. Um, what I'm trying to do is obviously trying to be a little bit more scalable in terms of having a proper community um, platform, whether that's um, an inventory, um, having the database of projects, whether there's a platform of communication where people can chat and have a forum base. So trying to move things off email a little bit. But, yeah, email is obviously the baseline, but I'm trying to do a little bit more technical scalability around the work. Um, but in terms of the other question, just beyond what um, Libby was um, suggesting in terms of um, project coordination, research coordination, or funding, is also what aspect of these projects in terms of concrete terms. If you're looking for more um, participants, volunteers, if it's more of an online digital sort of project, that's something, again, just coming back to an inventory, just making that project be aware, market it a little bit, whether it's social media or not. And I know, obviously, a lot of the Indian projects already have that in terms of whether it's on Twitter or Facebook. 
Um, the other aspect is also in terms of best practices or in the thematic subject space, if it's more around connecting um, other um, projects across the world, um, again, it is really just starting with, I think, as uh, Libby suggested, just as simple as an email, just keeping in touch and having sort of a, a network of people who sort of have represent um, some of these um, communication flow. I think that's important. So back to the point around if you guys have a specific chapter or a national sort of uh, Indian um, group, I think it's more just having um, a couple of these people who have connections to others so that some of those communication messages can be passed back and forth. And what I'm emphasizing really that bi-directional, understanding what's going on in the global space, whether it's funding opportunity, research opportunity, collaboration, versus also just marketing in terms of what's going on so that that might pique the interest of other people. Yeah, yeah, Mandel. I think that is, those are like very important things. And uh, uh, like, as I was saying, like from our side, what we'll try to do, we'll try to create, uh, like to start with a Google group or some kind of where all of you would be added and like, or more people, not only like limited to this group of people who is invited to this event, but more people will try to add from the India side. We'll also try to uh, like have you, uh, uh, Livy and Mantel, if you can, uh, if, if that's okay with you in that group. And then maybe you can share some of the things, some of the international initiatives on that side and like uh, some other Indian initiatives can also be shared on the, that group itself. So that could be, I think, a good first step. And then we can, uh, like, uh, from our side, we'll try to prepare this report maybe in a month or so because uh, I honestly, I'm traveling for, like, a couple of weeks and not, we're not going to be around. But once I'm back, uh, you know, we'll try to finish off this report and share with all of you. Uh, so have comments not only on the how to step, like establish and, uh, you know, increase collaborations, but also for the policy and the challenges aspects. And then... So when once the final one is ready, we'll share it uh, with the other stakeholders as well. So everyone is on the same page and we can start building kind of a larger national community, if, mm -hmm. uh, if that sounds okay to everyone. Uh, okay, I think uh, we are now over time by 30 minutes. So if anyone uh, wants to add, make some closing remarks, that uh, like we can go ahead and make those. Otherwise, then we end this uh, session. Sorry. Any remarks? Uh, no, just uh, we can now take these things forward over email. And as Dr. Ahota was suggesting, just create a Google Doc, dump all the links there, communicate, and uh, keep on keep the communication going. But yeah, this uh, the momentum needs to be there because a lot of the times, you know, we meet and then so. Yes, I think this is the this is the first time uh, Indian citizen science uh, multiple disciplines are uh, united in one meeting. At least I don't yeah. know since nine years. Sure. Even sure. in uh, um, in Astronomical Society of India meeting every year it happens, but there is no common session that everybody learned or heard a talk about citizen science. So uh, it's probably a beginning indeed. Yes, sir. Thank uh, you. We hope so. I, I really hope like yeah the momentum goes on uh, from here and then we really go towards building a proper community. Uh, with this, I would uh, uh, like to thank you all again for, for your precious time and also for sharing so many of your insights. I, I feel like uh, I have learned so much today uh, while listening to all of you and it has been a great, great uh, learning experience I, uh, for all the enlightening uh, like the sessions yeah. and the talks. So really amazing. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, very quickly, like uh, uh, we would like to, uh, if it's okay uh, with you, like we'll take a picture, group picture, just asking you to turn on your cameras. We have something for the record and also for the social media. Uh, uh, and then uh, we can end this session and then continue our conversation further on, on email and through other means. So I would request you to turn on your camera if that's all right. And then uh, my colleagues, uh, Kanchan and Devanjana, can take the screenshot. Thank you. Uh, uh, please let me know when it is done. <laughs> People can't hold their smile for too long. Yeah, it's done from my side. Thank awesome. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice Thank evening. You. Good night. Please. Have Thank a you. Good Bye. day. Take care. Bye bye. Thanks so much. Thanks all. Thank you. Great session. Thanks. Thank you. Come on. Thank you.